Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome here on um, Wild F uh, Pride and Safari Life. We are getting to the east of the property. We are located. Right. It's one of the breakaway of Ngati Pride. If I calculate it correctly here, I can see three individual uh, females, which they are break away from me. So early in the morning, they were around four. To look like the pride itself, they have really scattered around in the area in different locations. From myself, Rex in this afternoon, and Panda behind the camera, we are really grateful to have you joining us for the afternoon. We're looking for the great afternoon. Of course, it's very hot here. As you can see, the lines are all lying down flat. They're not moving anywhere. When we get here, they were really, all of them, they were upside down. Their back were up, the legs were up and lying on their back. Try to reflect the heat from the sign. It's awful. It really... And we'll have this opportunity to link to Cedric and he can able to say good afternoon to everyone. Yes, good afternoon everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here once again on our Sunset Safari. It is definitely a lovely day here at Okokuyo in Etosha. And um, I'm definitely looking forward to this afternoon's uh, Bumble. I'm sure everybody else is so much happening around here this afternoon. And what a great start to having Rex and the summer lions there in the Prydens. But anyway, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cedric Dold, and I am the naturalist on the water hole around on the Ukukuyu uh, pan here in uh, Namibia. So, uh, yes, I am... Definitely hoping that some of the bingo, still bingo fear, uh, uh, not going to say, uh, festive moments happening and you know that there is still so much happening. I'm hoping that the, the bingo contestants are going to uh, nail some of these amazing uh, sightings this afternoon. But if you've got any questions or any comments or any suggestions for us this afternoon, please send them through to us. We are definitely waiting for you and waiting for those questions. As you know, this is a, your safari and it's definitely being brought on throughout the entire African wilderness of ours. So, yes. And as you can see, it is a lovely day at Okokuyo Pan. There is definitely a beautiful dazzle of a zebra that's just busy enjoying a good old drink around the pan area. It has been quite active around here. We did have two amazing male elephants coming here during the day, during the escape to nature. And they did come for a little bit of a drink, but they did not stay too long, and they moved off. But yes, you never know what the day bring, uh, brings for all of us. As you know, it is so uh, we always expect the unexpected around the area. But yes, well, once again, I think I'll, I think I'll just put my little virtual bingo board on for this afternoon. Just kind of my imaginary board and uh, uh, paste some stickers around there because I know that there is one of the one of the th options on that bingo board is a dancing zebra so well, the dancing zebra well I've got a whole lot of zebras yeah I've got plenty of zebras here at the pan itself as you can see and I'm just hoping one or two of them starts dancing for me so if you can confirm a dancing zebra for me please let me know I will just put it on my imaginary board so, yeah, <laughs> I always have to play my imaginary board, yeah, it's just, unless I have to go all the way up to Namibia and run across that open clearing with my bingo board, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen. But anyway, while I sit here at Okokuyo Pan, let's head over back into Pridelands with old Rexon, as he's got those amazing 20 cats to show you. Well, are you back with me at Okokuyo? I do apologize. It looks like we're having a little bit of, a, a little bit of an issue that side in Pridelands. You never know, but it is in the bush. You know, there is so many 
obstacles that we have to work around. But yes, that is fine. As long as we got some amazing zebras that's just pretty much come down for a good afternoon drink. And one thing I can say here at Okokuyo Pan that the sunsets are absolutely amazing because exactly where the camera is uh, positioned and the way it is looking, um, the sun sets directly west, so it's looking directly west. And sometimes you get an amazing sunset. Uh, Kate, I've been looking at throughout the couple of, the last couple of days and that um, Kate, the, this water hole gets quite busy uh, not early in the morning, It's I think it's still a little bit fresh uh, and a little bit cool and all that but I think a little bit around about 11, 12 o'clock it, it gets really active, a lot of springbuck, hemsbok, zebra, wildebeest they all come down for the afternoon or the early, or actually not early, late of uh, late morning, there we go late morning drink and um and that's when it starts getting quite hot around this area um as well as a little bit in the afternoon as well like midday and coming up to like three four o'clock as well you'll see a lot of times the animals are coming up but it also depends on the weather so if the weather is quite hot around all over the show um and or at okakuya itself then you'll find that um these animals tend to come down more frequently because of you know, hot weather, it's going to definitely draw a bit of a thirst. So yes, on cool days, I think uh, yesterday, uh, late afternoon, it was quite cool. The rain started coming in and all that. It just seemed to kind of die down a little bit. But yes, this pan, but this pan is very busy. This pan is so so busy all the time. Um, zebras, I think today we counted at one stage. Um, drinking at once, there were about f between 40 to 45 zebras in a row. So it just shows you how active this pan can get. My Chateau Game Reserve has a glowing reputation as one of the most beautiful reserves in Southern Africa. And now, atop a soaring cliff overlooking the Majale River beneath the groves of Euphorbia succulents sits the stunning new Mashatu Euphorbia Villas. These eco-friendly villas echo their beautiful natural surroundings shaped to match the Mapanu parts of Mashatu. Enjoy earthy glamour with a consciousness for conservation woven into every element of these camps within the 32,000.
Well, it definitely looks like a lot of <coughs> zebras. That's one thing that is, uh, does attract is uh, zebras. And it's a, these uh, dazzle of zebras, have, it's, it's amazing. They actually take turns. So you'll get one harem coming in for a drink and another harem waiting on the outskirts. And as soon as that one herd has finished drinking, they will move away and the next one will come in. It's almost like a, it's almost, I can say, like a conveyor belt. And um, it's amazing to see how many come, how many zebras do come through. And it's, yeah, that's one thing. It's one, one of my wishes to do is to go up to Namibia and take a look at all these amazing animals and just to see these big herds coming through the side and uh, well that's definitely on my bucket list but as I said uh, well done birding and all that but uh, it looks like the wind has died down because today was very windy uh, and we had a step buzzard in this uh, this tree is called the ama tree A-M-A tree ama tree so it's one of the acacia trees and um I saw a step buzzard coming pretty much landing on top there and just roosting and just kind of watching over the area. And it was definitely one of the, a nice sighting to have because I don't think I saw a step buzzard yet in Juma because I know they do exist around that area. They do come through that area as well. So, um, but I haven't seen one that side. So it was nice just to uh, get a view on uh, that uh, amazing bird species. But yes, as I said, this tree is called the Ama tree. Yes, Ama, Ama Zing Zing. Not an Ama Zing Zing, but it's just an Ama tree. And um, it definitely is one of the acacias. It's got, uh, in this tree itself, it's got two thorns, two long white thorns, just like the scented thorn, like the um, uh, scented thorn and uh, the red thorn. They do have, and the flaky thorns, so they do have those long white thorns, typical with their case of the species. And apparently the pod is very much kind of, almost has a twist to it. So if you're looking at a t pod of, um, uh, there's a certain tree, uh, the, uh, the wild uh, wattle. So the wild wattle is the same thing. If you're looking at the wild wattle uh, pod, it's very much twisted with the seeds inside. And those seeds are very edible. So you get many things like your your parrots and your lurries actually going, even your mouse birds, they'll actually go and try and seek out those little seeds in the pod. Uh, Picasso, my animal that surprised me the most anyway. Um, sure. Uh, oh, that's a difficult one to, to answer because I'm trying to think exactly if that animal. I think um, the, sk the skimmer, the African skimmer. Um, I saw the African skimmer, that's a bird. Uh, the African skimmer there um, at, uh, not Juma, but it was at Arethusa. And I don't know if it got lost. They don't, they don't exist there. So we actually had an African skimmer around Arethusa Lodge. Uh, for maybe three, four days, and yeah, it was quite interesting. And quite the dam at Arethusa was quite full, so it was full itself. And the skimmer bird was just skimming across, putting the beak down. So yeah, very strange place for it, because I know the other area that they had an African skimmer was pretty much there towards Lower Sabi, at a, uh, one of the pans called uh, the Sunset Dam or Dam, Sunset Dam. And I have seen one around that side. But that does happen sometimes. You'll find like with tropical storms and all that, it does sometimes put uh, birds off their course and into areas that they don't belong in. So, yes, my African skimmer definitely was quite a surprise at Arethusa. But I know they had brown hyena on uh, Juma. So don't forget, they have had brown hyena on Juma. That was in 2009. 2008, 2009. Um, one of my colleagues um, that used to work at Arethusa, of course at Traverse there, and uh, in 2008, 2009, they had a brown hyena at Twin Dams. Can you believe it? So, I'd have never believed it until uh, she showed me, and I said, okay, well, no, that's um, something to, to believe. So, yes, it could be around, you never know. It could be that surprise, that element of surprise that you all of a sudden see something like that just appear. 
Let's say one of the guys, uh, one of the colleagues as well at in Koro, they had an art wolf. Never thought, I mean, I worked in Koro for uh, several years. And I never thought there would be an art wolf in that area. So, definitely something that I want to see, Picasso. Can imagine seeing something like that there? I would be, also imagine seeing an art wolf on Juno. That'd be fantastic. But as you can see, it's beautiful way to the side. Uh, France, you, it's not so they can, they can send certain things, like, I mean, it's uh, certain animals, like, your, for instance, like a black rhino. It'll send that little, definitely can feed from your phobias and from, from the tambourtis and all that. Um, definitely a giraffe, if it has to go to a, a euphobia. And euphobia is going to be a little bit rough, it's going to be a little bit tough, and that uh, I'm sure it's going to realize it's not going to be ideal for it. So, oh, we've got elephants. Hello. Here we go, we got elephants coming up to uh, uh, your pan. That's got a good timing. But yeah, they can they can scent on what they want to feed on. Um, you're looking at like elephants, looking at this elephant now. So you look at the they with the round leaf teak, for instance. A round leaf teak is gonna be um, when it comes to the leaf side of things, the tannin is very high, same as the the terminalias, the, the silver cluster leaf. The, the tannin. The tannin is very high and once the tannin becomes quite uh, high that the animals tend to kind of rather avoid that. It's the same as giraffe. Giraffe will never feed downwind because what happens if they feed on uh, one acacia now and they're feeding downwind, what happens is that acacia will send um, a scent through to the next tree, to the next, uh, uh, to the next acacia, to the next uh, 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 a sickle bush, whatever tree it is, downwind, and those trees will realize, wait, hold on, but there is a uh, a browser coming along, let's increase the tannin, and as soon as you increase the tannin, those animals tend to kind of rather avoid it, so they rather feed upwind, and that's, um, so yeah, I think they pick up on those, uh, those, uh, those signals. It looks like we just got a, a single male that's just coming through in. Looks like an old male once again. Oh, sorry, my, <coughs> my camera work is not the greatest. Let's try another cam up. I don't have that steady hand. But it's nice just to see this male just coming to have a drink throughout the cam. Not the biggest of males. Um, the other two that came during the daytime, during the escape to nature, they were way bigger. Oh, look at that dust cloud. They're all dust. Twirly whirly, that's hitting past it. Yeah, that's typical. Yeah, I've seen so many little dust uh, twisters that do come through. Um. Well, we can just go and sit here at uh, Okokuya Pan and just enjoy the noises of the nature for the time being. And enjoy this and no elephant. Enjoy this afternoon drink.
Yeah, it's just amazing those uh, dust clouds that's coming through. It's amazing how this uh, the weather here in Namibia is, it gets so many twisters that come through here. Uh, I've, I've seen other like today, or maybe like five, six of them, but like proper, proper twisters. And uh, we don't get this at all in that uh, in Mapumalanga low felt area towards Juma side to actually see these huge, huge dust uh, twisters coming through. So it's quite pretty. Uh, I think it's nice. I've had one. Um, a uh, water, uh, call it a, a water spit, water spit, where of course the water kind of uh, twirls like that, and um, there was that Biffleswick Dam, which was incredible. But yeah, just nice just to watch this and uh, enjoy these moments. Good afternoon everybody and greetings from Amakala Game Reserve. I hope you're all doing well on what is a little bit of a rainy afternoon here on Amakala. But still, nevertheless, nice opportunity to go out and hopefully get a few, few points on that bingo board. Lovely view, isn't it? So, good afternoon again. My name is Andrew and I have my good friend BK behind camera. We hope you're doing good today. Today's a nice day to head out, so yeah, we're going to enjoy this cool weather for a change after yesterday being pretty hot. We didn't go out yesterday, but uh, it was yo, in the in the 40s, somewhere around there, uh, even inside the shade. It was terribly, terribly hot. And today it is just so different, 9 degrees, 10 degrees difference. So yeah, it's really something you have to get used to out here. Being in the Eastern Cape is drastic weather changes. Beautiful view, isn't it, eh? Wonderful little lookout spot just above Eloweni. There's a little lodge here called Eloweni Lodge. It's not a commercial lodge or anything, just a sort of a lookout and a little platform for people to have their sundown and drinks. And uh, we are just right next to it, enjoying the overlook of the basin. You'll notice it's getting nice and green in there. Grasses are slowly starting to grow. And I think a lot of the general plains animals are going to start going down there. Just spectacular, isn't it? So we've been fortunate enough, we get to explore all these little zigzags and spaghetti junctions of roads that you can see there. It gets a little bit confusing sometimes, because uh, there are so many roads out here. If I had to give you an estimation, there is probably about, with all the roads together, probably added up to about 120 or 130 kilometers worth of roads on Amakala Game Reserve, so you can imagine, that is a lot. Maybe even a bit more than that, maybe about 150 kilometers of roads. And they all have their own names. <laughs> Beautiful, and you can actually see some of the valleys in the far distance with the hills. So that far distant one that you're seeing right at the end there, that is uh, probably the Lankloof Valley. And there's Flucky's Flay, that little pan at the bottom there. And we can expect some safari trucks to be out today. As it is prime time game viewing time now. But in the meanwhile, we're going to send you over to Liam, not too far away in Karicha. He wants to say hello to you all. Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Karicha. My name is Liam and I'm coming to you from a fairly 
iffy afternoon here in Kariha. Seems like it's not too dissimilar from what's going on over in Amakala. Uh, that uh, a very small percentage of rain that was forecast for today seems to have arrived. But it's nothing too serious so far, so we should be able to keep on coming to you. We've got a couple of zebras here who are taking in a bit of this nice cool afternoon weather with a little zebra foal alongside its mum. Quite a nice scene. Wee little one. This often gives animals a little bit of a kick in their step, you know, a bit of bounce to, to move around, higher energy. But it has been a fairly warm day today, so mm, it might still set a bit of a lull. Animals are moving around a bit more than they were earlier. So, yeah, there's um, some hope for some activity this afternoon. This little one looks like it doesn't want to get out of bed. It says, Mum, can we, can we have the afternoon in? Now, oh, very, very, very nice. There's another <clears throat> couple of bless book on on the side here. I was uh, listening to their little bellows earlier, which is very. It's quite a subtle little sound they make, and uh, they use this little little bellowing bleat to, to as a contact call to their parents, to their mother. And you, you do sometimes hear it when they you know, start getting agitated or moving around, and there's a lot of movement going on. The little one will will bleat to call to its mother. It's a, a kind of a prompt prompt to action to say, Mom, where are you? I don't know what's going on. There's this chaos all around here. Find me. I'm bleeding. It's really neat to see this little this box seems to be starting to graze. And that would be yeah, it would be hardly, hardly a month and a bit. So it's really quite nice and soon. Ah, so Bianca asks, do all zebra species have the same mating season? So my my simple answer to that would would be would be no, and uh, the reason why is because, well. There's actually, it's an interesting way to answer it because, well, if you look at all three of the species of zebra, you look at, in southern Africa, you've got the mountain zebra and you've got the plains zebra. So the mountain zebra, which is mostly in the Cape and a little bit in the western half of the country in the Namib, the Cape, at least, mostly gets a winter rainfall. So that might change the you know the seasonality of their breeding. I'm not too sure what the, the seasonality of a Cape Mountain Zebra is. And then you've got the Plain Zebra in Southern Africa and then you also get them in the north, so in the northern part of Africa. So that would be a very different season between Southern and, and the northern part of the, the Plain Zebra range. So that would, that, you know, within that species of zebra, this or this species of zebra, the plain zebra, you can see there'll be seasonality. And then the Grevy's zebra, which is found up in mostly in Kenya, in a very limited range in, in Kenya. And so again, you know, the seasons up there would be different to down here. So I'd say yes. Uh, I mean, there's, there's quite some difference. Um, um, yeah, in, in the different seasonality of, of of the, the breeding of different species of zebra. 
and that's mostly because their range covers such different areas. You know, think of the Western Cape, you know, where you know, but mostly the winter rainfall. You'd have a flush of, of 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 new growth during the dry season. So yeah, um, during the wet season. So all those different uh, areas that you would find these zebras might uh, give them a different season to breed. So thanks for your question there Bianca. So whilst the ponder on the breeding seasons of zebras, let's go and have a look what's happening with Lauren this afternoon. Good afternoon everyone. It is definitely not going to rain here in Medique. The temperatures are soaring. And we have a lovely scene here of giraffes. We're back in the east. We're no longer in the northwestern corner. And to be honest, the northwestern corner was uh, unbelievably amazing. But it did lack giraffes. It's really the east where you come and you get the sea of giraffes, where they just go on forever. It's incredible. Good afternoon. My name is Lauren Davies on camera. I do have giraffe on my bingo board, but they must be drinking. So that's a tricky one because these ones are not drinking. They're all just, well, standing around. And this male, the big tall male on the right, he is tending to her. He is literally not letting her out of his sight. If she moves right, he goes right. If she moves left, he goes left. She must be coming into Estrus. She looks very young to me, but... To be honest, female giraffes are so much smaller than the males. And it isn't until you see them together that you realise, wow, there's quite a difference there. I don't believe she's quite in Estrus yet, but my goodness, he is not letting her out of his sight. Look how proud he looks. Yes, she is very beautiful, but personal space is a thing. Look, he's right up behind her. It's crazy. He obviously wants to mate with her, and that's how giraffes roll. I think Liam is also talking about mating. Oh, look at all the quilias. And they form that tending bond. Cindy, you're asking what do giraffes do when they are threatened? I think I'm just going to double check that that was the question, Cindy. That is correct. Okay, I'm not hearing things. When they feel threatened. Interesting, because really the only threat is a pride of lions or a lion, really. And a leopard's not going to go for a giraffe. A calf, maybe. But a giraffe like this is going to be a pride of lions that are going to tackle this together and try and get the giraffe to run, panic, and trip. So when a giraffe notices a threat... <laughs> see, look, she steps, he steps. Oh, it's amazing. It's like a mirror. Um, they're not entirely vocal than we think they are, that we can hear anyway. But they do stare down their threat. So they're going to see a lion and immediately their body posture will change. They'll go very, very straight and they'll stare down the lions. The worst thing a giraffe can do is turn around and run. Now, giraffes like to be in one another's company. They don't really have a strict social structure per se, but they just... <laughs> see, another step and another step. <laughs> They like to be around other giraffes. They just are that way. You'll find lots of them together. And it's not for safety in numbers. They just show preference to be around one of their own. They were always thought to be silent, but they're actually not. They're very, very vocal, especially at night. So when it comes to when they feel threatened, they're not entirely vocal to our ears. But very possibly, they tell each other there's a threat, but we just can't hear it. So they don't really do much when threatened. They try to stare down the threat as much as possible. Obviously, they've got those powerful legs, so if a lion really does approach, they can kick. There's a horrible video online of a giraffe kicking a lion, and it's awful. 
And I mean, if the lion gets kicked by that, it's most likely fatal. So they do have their own sort of weapons. <gasps> okay, that went to, from zero to a hundred really quickly. <laughs> I don't think she's fully ready, boy. Lawazi, it just got a lot more interesting, huh? It's very interesting. And this is what giraffes do. He doesn't want any single male. He's a dominant male. He looks in very good physical condition, probably in his prime, and he's very, very dark, which shows that he's really dominant. The dark patches really are more related to social structure than they are age in giraffes, as once thought. So he's a strong boy. He's obviously came across this female who may, may be in Estrus or just coming into Estrus. And he just won't let her out of his sight. She can't escape him. And they do call it a tending bond, but to be honest, I mean, she really has no choice. Ah, is that ox, ox peckers on the back there? Let me just see if ox peckers are on my board. I needed them yesterday and they let me down. And no, they're not on today's board. <laughs> But it's nice to see ox pickers all the same. And he's going to keep trying to meet with her and keep trying to meet with her. And he really won't stop until they do meet. And this is when male giraffes really will fight. And oh boy, do they fight. I always think they look so gentle and graceful. And they are. But my goodness, when two males fight, it, it's... Quite unsettling to watch, actually. She looks tiny. She looks really petite. That's a female behind her as well, and she's much smaller than this female. This is a young girl. Okay, we've got bingo to play, I believe, so we're going to keep bumbling and see what else we can find. I'm going to make a combination of the thorns and the bark. That's what I'm going to do. It's basically just a very big open system. But aren't they pretty? Thank you for joining us and have a fantastic morning. Thank you. 
Good afternoon everybody and welcome back to Juma Private Game Reserve and we have started the afternoon with a couple of potentially courting terrapins and a view of our little lapwing family at Treehouse Dam. Everybody sheltering in the shade as you can see, well certainly the one on the left there, it's a nice warm afternoon here. Uh, but there's been a distinct lack of animals coming down to drink at Treehouse Dam which is unusual. But Dewey is present and correct although only his nostrils are visible from time to time. He's having a nice little snooze in the middle of the dam. I might be able to see that. He's, I think he's just... Oh, there he is, just on the right-hand side. You can see that little tiny line in the water, just his nostrils sticking up. <laughs> Evidence of a nosy hippo. There you go. What's that is? No, that's the top of his head. Oh, there he is. Hello. Say hello to your fans. <laughs> or not. <laughs> but anyway, we will see what the afternoon has in store. Of course, I am hopefully waiting for him to laugh, because I do need a laughing hippo for my bingo board this afternoon. But I am Ben. On camera, I have got Eagle with me. We are out in Rooster. Um, and we have no specific plans, uh, but I must show you my board, because it probably involves me going to Chitwa, because I have things like a fish eagle in a dead tree to look for, a sleepy crocodile, laughing hippos certainly. Uh, in fact I've got two fish eagles in dead trees which might be a little bit of a challenge. I think in terms of what we will be going for this afternoon, not that we have anything specific, possibly along the bottom here, waterbuck, often get it chidwa, sleepy crocodile, oxpecker, butterflies and that uh, little fish eagle. Or perhaps this one, a dashing impala, dust bathing, spur fowl, a laughing hippo, another waterbuck and some more butterflies. So we must keep our eyes open for some butterflies actually whilst we're here, Igor, now that we are on the clock. So I think it's about time that we had a result because we've had quite a few no results. I was scuppered last night by a pesky elevated Egyptian goose. I managed to find everything but that and I never thought I would lose by not finding the correct type of Egyptian goose considering there are so many around. But Alas, that's not a problem. We will enjoy the views here at Treehouse Dam. I've got a nice shady spot. And we were just waiting and hoping that maybe we would get some elephants or something come down and drink, because we haven't seen any elephants on Juma for like four or five days now, which is very, very strange. I'm hoping also on Chitwa to pick some up. We have had tracks, uh, but they don't seem to have been hanging around. They've just been coming through. Okay, I'm going to spend a little bit more time here and hope that something comes down for a drink. Uh, but Taylor is also out and about, so let's send you over to her so she can say good afternoon to everybody. I think waiting for elephants is a very good idea. However, we found lots and lots of elephant tracks that go all the way up in Yala South and North and Bifflesook Dam and then out they go to the North. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is uh, Rian. We are on Juma Private Game Reserve and we are currently driving in the Mulwati drainage line. What have I got on the ground? I found a feather. I'm going to, oh, sorry, I'm going to, I forgot I was in sand for a second. Uh, let me just unstick from the chair. I found a feather. Woo! It's pretty. Look how nice it is. Don't you think that's so lovely? It's very nice. So like it's recently been deposited here. It's still in very good condition. It doesn't look super tatty. Um, when I start to look at it immediately, I notice that the outside is very, very feathered. It's not, it hasn't got smooth edging uh, that you quite often uh, see with a lot of other bird species. And it's got these very, very obvious big white sort of patterns here. I'm wondering if this is maybe, oh gosh, I don't know. Is it maybe from a nightjar? I don't know if it's from an owl. Interesting. I now obviously can't think of one bird that has this kind of coloration, but um, this big white spot reminds me very much of what uh, you'd maybe see uh, on a tail feather um, for a for a nightjar or something along those lines. But who knows? Anyways, we'll keep it with us. And if you do have any suggestions as to what it might be, let us know. But this feather has no more use to the bird in which it came from. That's probably why it either fell out or maybe during a preening session it actually was removed physically because it's not doing its job. Cool, I'm gonna jump back in the car. 
Oh, and we're going to try and see what we can find in the drainage. And I'm really sad that we missed a whole herd of elephants because there were lots of little babies. Now, apparently Lauren has my favorite animal. Is it an elephant or is it something else? Well, we are very much being welcomed back to the East, that's for sure. The lovely small hairs of elephants. They look very dark, which says to me they've been swimming already, which is a little bit unfortunate. Because we are heading round to a quarry that's filled up with water, and I was hoping to catch elephants swimming. But of course, these guys are already damp. They've already had their swim. They will probably go for another one with today's temperatures, but who knows where they're probably going to feed a lot first but i do have elephant on my bingo board everyone so i shall wait for your confirmation it's quite a small herd Elephants love the essence of summer, everything about summer. Oh, confirmed already. Excellent. If I can get my stickers. Come on, stickers. Okay, enormous elephant. We're going to try and get jackals. It's quite easy in the east. Lions, blah, 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 we will show try. Impala should be easy, and mongoose definitely easier here than in the northwest. So that's the one we're gonna go for, but let's see. Lions should be pretty easy. Oh, there are actually more elephants coming, it's not that small a herd. It's amazing how everything just comes to life in summer. And although I don't, I really don't like driving in the rain. I don't enjoy it. I'm not going to pretend that I do. It just is remarkable when you're in the harshest winter and with the first sort of onset of rains of spring, the transformation of the land is very quick. It doesn't take long for the landscape to turn green. It doesn't take long for the insects to just appear out of nowhere. And of course... The great diapause is over, the insects are out, and it's that environmental cue of water. Water is the trigger for, for summer. And it just always amazes me how quickly the grass shoots out, how quickly the flowers bloom. Naturally, as summer progresses and the rain progresses, it gets more and more thick and green. But that onset, that very first sort of transformation is really quick. I've just seen an Impala derby, sorry. Um, I didn't catch that question, I'm afraid. <laughs> They're running now. Wait, they might come into view. I'm not used to driving Blondie. I haven't been in that many cars. Come on, Impala. Ah, uh, Impala, here we come on my bingo board. Are you dashing? Yes, you are. There we go. Chad, they're trying to cool down. Chad is 10 years old and he's asking why do elephants flap their ears? And it's their very own ventilation system. Very own air conditioning unit. So they're trying to cool down. The heat is phenomenal today. And elephants don't sweat like we do. So they've got big bodies, large surface area, and these ears actually help them lose most of the heat. They're specially designed just for the elephant, though. They're not just ears. They really are equipped to cooling them down. Oh, those impalas are so dashing. Okay, 
If I get my Impalas as two in a row, not a bad start, I would say. Now I just need to think how we're going to go and find some lions. Okay, let's go ahead and see if we can get another view of the Ellies. Um, Dobby, can you work with this at all? Okay, Impalas are confirmed. I'll quickly show you before. <laughs> Two in a row, elephant and Impala. Looks like it's gonna be a good one today. We just need to find, Mongoose will probably be the most tricky one, do you know that? In Juma, Mongoose are so easy to find. Okay, we better get on our mission in order to win bingo. <laughs> nice to hear progress on the bingo boards there. So I tell you what, if there was a bingo board for Kareha, shoo, lots of general game and yeah, yeah, I think I'd fill it up in no time. Quite honestly, such an abundance of wonderful general planes game on, on the planes down here. Ostriches, some impala, zebras, bless book. So, so abundant. This male ostrich seems to be on a mission somewhere, I'm not quite sure where. I'm trying to see where does he end up. There's a couple of others further off to the left. He was hanging out with a moment ago. Well, he's making his way somewhere else, it seems. Somewhere behind a hill and beyond. Seems to have a nice bit of glowing red on his bill and legs. So certainly um, a bit aroused and in the mood. Amazing contrasts that ostriches, male ostriches' feathers put out. You can see them from a mile away. Really conspicuous creature. Unlike the slightly more camouflaged female. It's funny that the starlings aren't too bothered. I wonder where Jarrett went. Bye. Yes, Sylvia to Okokuyu, and I'm just taking a look. <coughs> uh, we had that one male elephant that was around here, and he is still hanging around just to the right of the screen. And I'm hoping that he's coming back again. But as you can see, his, his body is completely wet and nice and muddy. And quite a warm day around this side, so... Ideal for him, a good old bath, a good old swim. 
And maybe it looks like he wants to come back for more. You never know. But sometimes you can see it dry up. Sometimes they actually try and get that sand. And especially if their body is wet. So if they actually spray themselves with water and get their body nice and wet, you'll find sometimes they'll actually grab some dust and just kind of throw it on their body just to kind of make a little bit of a paste, like a mud, and it actually acts like normal, like a wallowing. And then they can go and rub it off very soon. I just want to see what he's going to do here. See if he's going to maybe do throw some dust on his back. Absolutely a stunning boy. Not the largest of tusks. I haven't seen big tuskers here yet at, uh, at Okakuyu. Um, most of them, is, I've seen a lot of elephants that uh, their tusks have been broken off. Um, and uh, a shortened tusk, but nice and thick uh, tusks, but nothing too, too long. He's going to go in all the way back in chair. There he is. With a beautiful dazzling of zebras at the back. And maybe I thought I was going to get to maybe a, a virtual sticker on my board with a elephant drinking water. Plop! There he is, on my board. Oh, look at that. Absolutely beautiful. Yep. Oh, an Egyptian goose is in his way. Egyptian just has to uh, yeah, stay out of here. I don't want to have a six ton elephant trampling on that uh, goose. It will not be, not be safe. So, can, of course, see what he's going to do now. So, this is where the inlet is. So, you'll find there is a pipe that comes through from the borehole, kind of uh, being pumped up to this area. And then, of course, from this pipe, it will go into the pan itself. But yeah, while we watch this male try and maneuver his trunk around these rocks, let's head down into the eastern Cape at Kariha. As a Liam wants to show you something. Ah, good old Ellie's. Miss them pachyderms. Nice to be with a couple of Elat now. Um, and uh, hey, is that is that perhaps our good friend Blaze? Well, it certainly, yeah, it certainly could well be this particular blessed book in the foreground. Could be our buddy Blaze, the recently named resident blessed book. I don't seem to see any males anywhere near the usual hangout spot, which is not far from me here. So I've got my bets on this particular blessed book being Blaze. Very nice, very nice. You can see a little bit more, uh, a little slightly more boldly marked compared to a, a female blessed book. Let's see if I can try and point some out we've actually got a couple just to the left and blaze seems to be on his way to his regular hangout over here so i'm feeling very confident that that this is our good friend now just to give you a bit of a comparison i'm gonna i'm gonna pan keep on panning here to the left and try and join this herd of uh of females Couple of parlors, some in Yalev. So, appears to be a group of females. Where's the youngster? So, Harold, um, I, yeah, sure, I think probably yesterday, eh, I'd say, got into the upper 30s. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd say yesterday was the hottest I've experienced down here in Kariha so far. But uh, I imagine, I imagine 
January and February to be even hotter on average. Um, I've, I've definitely experienced um, hotter than 30, the upper 30s, uh, certainly in you in the Kalahari, it's uh, yeah, it really, it really gets hot. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure some of the team over in uh, in uh, Okokwe will, will attest to those searing summer days in Namibia. We are quite lucky in Karika to at least have the ocean nearby, and that moderates temperature so nicely. But because we're in a bowl here in the in this in this section of Karika, it does it does kind of get a little bit humid, like a little bit of a soup bowl. Well, anyways, I'll start chill off in the cool here with these lekker blesbok. Let's go and have a look what Taylor has found for you. I don't know if I've ever heard anyone refer to blesbok as cool, but I suppose it's a first round for anything. We are with the cool owl chicks and they're just chilling as you can see actually they're not just chilling they are very fixated on anything i imagine uh, that their attention span is very similar to mine because anything that moves or rustles or makes a noise so do they and i also hear lots of ox pickers behind us all of a sudden so i'm not sure what mammal is on its way towards us but we'll just sit quietly in the not quietly because i'm going to talk so but we'll just sit here in the shade now i haven't seen this lot before, which is quite cool, the first time I've actually come around to try and find the uh, the chicks. And I was hoping that they were going to be sitting out in the open, but they are tucked behind a couple of bushes. But who can blame them after the warm day? There's lovely shelter there with all those trees and of course the watchful owl, nope, the watchful eye of the adult. Uh, I think it, I suspect that it's the female that's just sitting up. You can only just see her silhouette. The sun's not working in our favor right now um, but I think once it kind of moves a bit then we will yeah, hopefully get a better view but this is awesome. I did see the the wigs last year. Uh, they did have, did they have chicks or did they have eggs? I can't even remember. I think they actually just had eggs when I saw them last which was quite a, no they couldn't have there must have been, I can't remember, I have to go back and look at my pictures. Like I said, things go in a vault and then I forget about it. But these will not be the same chicks. This is, of course, a different um, set of chicks. And I'm glad that they're doing so well. Look at you, so fluffy. And your eyes are so yellow. And one thing that we do have on our board this afternoon, because I forgot for a moment that we were playing bingo, we'll wait for confirmation, however, is... Um, we have observant owl. There's some residue. Get off from the last sticker. I'm assuming this must have been Ben's board because I haven't got observant owl, perhaps from the other afternoon. Um, so yeah, so we will hopefully get a confirmation that that is, yeah, that we can have that one. And then I think we can achieve this. I'm gonna try bingo today. I think that this is very easy. We can find a hornbill, we can find a roller, we can most certainly find a dung beetle and a dashing impala. I'll give you ten of those. I'm joking. I'm being, I'm being cocky again, and I shouldn't because we know how that goes for me. A little owls. Gregory, that's a wonderful question. Um, now, I'm, I'm glad that you've made the statement, though. So I suppose it's not really a question; it's a statement. Um, where you've said that you are so surprised as to how big the the wiglets have got i don't even know how big they were i mean i'm assuming they're much smaller you also have to help me out with their age i mean they're, they're quite fluffy you can still see a fair amount of down feathers on on them and they normally leave the nest and i know you've probably heard this a whole bunch of times after about three weeks where they start to sort of venture around and um explore a little bit more but i don't think that they are quite four or five months old yet i'm sure that they're under that i'm going to take a complete random guess now dare i say that they're maybe like six weeks old 
May just over maybe just over two months, eight weeks old. I don't know. We're going to see how good at guessing I am. I have not got a lot of experience with owl chicks. In fact, um, very little. And, and the owl chicks that I have seen have been of the much smaller kind than the spotted eagle owl, normally of November. Okay. Sorry, I just got the date. They hatched around the 10th of November. So that's about right, hey? Yeah, six weeks, almost six weeks, I would say, roughly, five five to six weeks old. Okay, not too terrible. Huh. Yeah, and my maths is not my strong point either, but um, we, won't, we won't go in today of things I'm not good at because, oh, I could actually do an entire drive on that, two drives, in fact. Anyways, we'll just focus on the wildlife. But what I was going to say to you is uh, I have seen lots of little barred owl chicks and also the chicks of um, this, uh, one of those other ones, pill-breasted uh, owlets. They are so cute. And we had barred owlets in Pridelands quite a bit. Um, there's a, a pair of adults that nest there and then they have their little chicks last year It was three that they had and they become so relaxed They just bounce around the branches and camp quite happy to be around everybody and they eventually got so relaxed that they'd like literally land on the floor you know, while you're walking because you've disturbed an insect, you know, you kind of want to feel like a Disney princess, you know, when you have a swallow or something fly past you, but when a owlet chick lands on the floor and you hear thud, not the same effect, but they were, they were quite sweet and, and, and watching them grow was, oh, it was just amazing. And then in Botswana, there was a horrible situation in one of the eco training camps. There was an apple leaf tree that had hollowed out and the, um, Pearl spotted owlets, no, it was also barred owlets, sorry, were nesting and the entire tree collapsed one night. We suspect that the termites might have hollowed it out a bit and it just became quite weak. On, but on a windy night, it tipped over and then there were these tiny little chicks. They definitely weren't anywhere near ready to fledge yet, but they managed to climb all the way up to a branch, which I was really surprised by. And they survived, which was quite cool. They just lived in the bushes. They became bush owls and uh, no more cavities for them. Anyways, I think we'll probably head off and maybe swing back past here a little bit later when we've got a better view of the owls, but off we go to Lauren in Madikwe. We have got some zebra for you all. Sorry about the radio. Typical. Dancing zebra. Oh yes, on my board. And I've just realized I do have ox beggars on my board. If I can backtrack, please. If not, then, well, what to do? I shall find more if not. But right now we do have some dancing zebras. I would say that the giraffe population is higher here in comparison to the Northwest and it's the direct opposite for the zebras. We do get a lot of zebras here, but definitely in the Northwest. Wow, there are just so many. I just love seeing them. It's such a rare thing when you go to, well, when you're in Juma, seeing zebras are a big deal. And some of them are still so heavily pregnant. I feel a little bit sorry for them. I mean, they really, really show. They don't have petite bellies. It just, they are very pregnant. Why do they have no ox pickers? They must be the cleanest of all zebras. Ox pickers are actually harder to come across than you would think. Okay, I shall sit tight and wait to see if my zebra are confirmed, but we're going to send you over to Ben, who's on his way to Chitwa.
Well, welcome back to Juma. Are you looking for a fluttering butterfly? Oh, no. Well, there's our beautiful waterbuck. Uh, we also need a, a fluttering butterfly. I thought perhaps Eagle was on the case there, because I'm sure we'll find one. But we do have a beautiful waterbuck bull who looks, so we were saying now, particularly staunch, as we would say here, particularly well-built. You can see he's a solid-looking animal, this one, in very, very good condition. And so he should be, as a territorial male of this sort of open clearing close to Chitwa Dam. He's got access to one of the best territories around, I would suggest. So it would make sense that one of the best and strongest bulls would be occupying it here. Particularly enjoying his sort of war paints that he's got on this afternoon. I don't know if you would agree, but it looks a little bit more distinctive than normal, a bit more contrasty. Whether that's anything to do with testosterone levels and his size and general magnificence which has perhaps created or made those uh, white flecks a little bit more obvious but you can clearly see his eyeshadow he's got on there that white ring under the throat and of course that lovely little white surround there is this sort of theory about all the whites around the eyes helping to reflect starlight and moonlight into the eyes i personally and it's just me personally but i don't really subscribe to that it doesn't make much sense uh, to me, from an optical perspective, I think it's much more likely that that is to draw attention to the eyes um, and the fact that they are sort of a, the uh, the conduit of emotion and dominance behavior and eye contact and facial features and things. So I see it, say, more like war paint. But he is an absolute brute of a waterbuck. Very, very pretty boy. And I'm sure he's got some females. I see no females in this immediate area, but... Uh, we normally do find some around Chitwa Dam, so he's maybe given them a long leash this afternoon and allowed them to uh, have a bit of a wander, safe in the knowledge that they're probably not going to leave his very, very nice feeding grounds here. And there is that white ring. Now, we are bingoing, um, and say so we do need to find a fluttering butterfly as well, but we do need a waterbuck white ring, so please don't forget to confirm that. In fact, I have two white rings on my board today so we will no doubt be stopping off for another water buck at some point maybe we can find this boy's females actually the water buck white ring is kind of on both the lines that i would be interested in going for this afternoon so i should have to make a decision as to which line we go for but i will wait for confirmation before we get ahead of ourselves but igor if you do see a butterfly fluttering somewhere let me know but what a beautiful waterbuck.
We're taking bingo very seriously today. There's a hornbill and it is hunting. It is very hungry. Look at it. Look how it's scanning, checking the African wattle to see if there's any beetles, any caterpillars. It's actually really fun to watch if you... Oh, there we go. Did it catch something? Yes, it caught something. That's a hungry hornbill, 100%. It's hungry, it's fed, it's done for the day, everybody. I'm still waiting for confirmation for the observant owl. Now the hungry hornbill. Will I get two stickers? Yes, please. Thank you very much. I'm sure you're all going to say yes, please say yes. That was a hungry hornbill, but we'll, we'll continue to find them. I'm tired of not winning now. Um, I'm a huge disappointment in my family because I come from a very con um, competitive family. Okay, we've got four... We've got stickers for the uh, uh, observant owl. Look, I'm even, that's two in one. That's a double sticker on one. And uh, you know, we'll just wait for the hungry hornbill. Should I be preemptive? Should I just wait here like this until somebody says yes? Say yes, somebody. Anyways, yeah, so I'm a big disappointment to my family. They um, have been putting a lot of pressure on me to win the game. And the fact that I haven't even won once, my dad says I'm not allowed to come home for Christmas anymore. So, yeah, it's quite sad, sad <laughs> depressing. So please let me win. Yes, Hungry Hornbill is confirmed. Thank you, Hornbill. I'm sad we didn't have... Um, the bat when we had the hornbill eating the bat because that was the hungriest hornbill I've ever seen. Okay, wonderful. Let's carry on because we're not messing around. We're going to be, before half past five, we're going to win. So that is in 50 minutes. Is it? No, I can't do maths. It's not. It's in 40 minutes. Why am I so terrible? I hope none of my teachers are watching from school. They'll just be like, she hasn't changed. Not even a little bit. She's still the same self. Distracting. We have to kick her out the classroom because she's disrupting the rest of the students. She tries to be funny all the time. Anyways, um, so we'll keep looking for the other things. There's been lots of hornbill, no, elephant activity on the roads. So I'm hoping that we're going to find a big bolus of dung. Then we're going to find a daring dung beetle. Like, it has to happen, or any dung, in fact. So we'll look for that. Of course, trying to find a roller today is going to be one of the hardest things to do, even though we see them all the time. I mean, I've even been seeing the European rollers flying around. So we've got European lilac-breasted and purple rollers to choose from that we see almost on a daily basis. If we don't, aren't successful here with a lilac-breasted roller, there's a pair of purple rollers that sit on the um, electrical wire that runs on the boundary road a bit further uh, east. So we'll try and go and do that. And then a dashing impala will, we know where to go for that. So I actually turned around, looked at camera and realized they look straight in the sun. So probably won't be doing that again. Hmm. I'm mentally preparing also to have a birding day, but I might have to do that in the morning, maybe tomorrow morning if it's um, on the quiet side. Or maybe try, no, stop looking at the camera tail. You're looking straight in the sun. Don't do it a third time. Sorry, I have to threaten myself. I give my I give myself pep talks. Yeah, Ben Ben's uh, determined that he's going to win today. I'm not sure how many he's got on his board, but off you go to him, and hopefully he doesn't add another one. Okay, well, we're still having a look around that open area on Chitwa and we have found some warthogs in the long grass there. Difficult really to make them out. You can just see their backs of the, the Loch Ness monster of warthogs there. You can see a couple of little ones just moving through the grass. Uh, ironically, we have no warthogs on our board this afternoon. We did yesterday. Uh, and that's just two days in a row we've seen warthog which is a nice surprise. But that long grass, you could see how difficult it is for those little ones. You can just see them moving around in between the two on the left and the one on the right. Uh, how difficult it would be for those youngsters to keep up with mum if she suddenly took off through the grass because there was a potential danger. And of course that is why they have that uh, sticky uppy tail, the radio controlled aerial. And so the little ones can watch mum when she's running through the grass and other members of the, the little sounder usually made up of an older female, maybe some um, females or males from last year. And then, of course, there are some little piglets around at the moment because this is very much piglet season for the warthogs. Uh, 
There's some lovely stories behind that tale. One of the traditional African stories as to why that tale sticks up is that the when uh, the creator was handing out all the skin for the animals, the warthog was off being gluttonous somewhere, because that's what sort of pigs do, I suppose. Uh, and he turned up late, and there was no skin left for the warthog, but the creator managed to find a little piece of elephant skin that was left behind, like a little offcut. And he was able to sort of stretch it over the warthog best that he could, uh, but it didn't fit properly, and it had to be so very tightly fitted across the back. And now every time when the warthog is running through the grass... He closes his eyes to protect his eyes from the grass seeds, and just by closing his eyes, that pulls the skin taut and pulls the tail up. That's one of those little traditional stories as to why that tail sticks up. Read into that what you will. There's an oxpecker. We do need a peckish oxpecker. That looked like a very peckish oxpecker, I thought. Look at him. Have a, have a peck. Has he got a peck? Always thinking about it. Come on, peck, oxpecker, peck. Well, in fairness, it doesn't say pecking oxpecker, it's a peckish oxpecker. Uh, afternoon, Lane, thank you for the question. Um, uh, no, as far as I know, it's not a standard family group. Oh, look at those little piglets. Uh, it's not a family group. The, a, a male and a female will mate, and then they'll go their separate ways, and then the same male may, may mate with other females, and it may be a different partner the following year. So they're not uh, close-knit family <laughs> units in that regard. And they don't normally socialise together. Often you find the big... Um, What's the word for a male pig? Why can't I think of the right word? Hmm? Bull. Boar. There we go. Thank you. I suppose that works for war talks, yes. I don't know why I had a bit of a, a a bad brain moment there. But, yes, so the bulls are often on their own, and then you get, say, females with some youngsters. This is a female here feeding. I can tell you that because it doesn't have the second set of warts halfway down the, uh, the snout. Ah, I believe that our peckish oxpeckers has been have been confirmed. Thank you very much. You might as well add that to the list. Now you see we should have put the water buck down here. Red water. Oh no, we've got another one there. What have we got there? Roaming rhinos. Mm, sleepy crocodile. Sleepy crocodile. I think I'm going to go for this one anyway, in case we find another water buck. So we've got one on the way here, one on the go here, and one here. Grooming lions is a problem, though. We haven't seen lions for a little while. Uh, we've also got some, uh, we thought, rather dashing impalas as well uh, in front of us. Let's try and reposition so we can get a better view of those for you. Or maybe, in fact, rather than the dashing impala, I think we should probably give you uh, the, the piglet that are just two. little piglets a little bit more. Uh, very cruel that these are considered one of the ugly five. Very beautiful in their own right. Unusual, perhaps. But I think ugly is a bit harsh. I don't know if you can see a dashing impala somewhere there. Can you... Uh, yeah, oh, look at him. And he's even thrashing around in the vegetation, so he's showing exactly how dashing he is. Shall we showing off to these youngsters? Lots of dashing in parlors. Look at him. Okay, while I hopefully it for my dome parlor confirmation, let's send you across to Rexon and see what's happening on Pridelands.
Right, we have a radiant roller. I also can't sing. There's a lot. Okay, so it seems as though we are doing a drive where I show you, we demonstrate to you all the things that I can't do. Singing is one of them, and conveniently, neither can the lilac breasted roller. They've got a more shocking voice than I do. So, uh, actually, we could do karaoke together, and I might be impressive in comparison to this bird. So, luckily, though, oh, it even just made a noise. Did I insult you? Are you going to now mob me and peck me to death? Please don't do that. Um, anyway, so I do think that this classifies as a radiant roller because it's got beautiful coloration and it did bring a smile to my day. It just, you know, they just radiate good energy all the time as well. And normally when people stop and see them for the first time, they all go, oh, wow, what's that bird? Brian did it the first time he saw a roller, hey? Mm. Yeah, yeah, he actually was, he, he was just telling me a story about it. He said it was one of the most memorable experiences he had as a kid was seeing a lilac breasted roller for the first time. So please give me the point. Um, <laughs> the, parrot the, the what? The parrot fish of the bush. The parrot fish of the bush. Yeah. Why? I don't get that joke, but I'm a bit slow. Anyways, okay. Well, I can't tick it yet. I'm just trying to do the thing where I just hold it again. Yeah, I mean, remember, if you've been checking out Wild Earth social media, especially on Instagram, you would have seen how I prep. So we, yeah. No, oh gosh, you can see I didn't practice today. That's how you stick it on. Cool, we've got three in a row. We are gonna win today. Okay, that's enough. You're probably all sick of us talking about how we're going to win bingo and then no one wins bingo. <laughs> right, let's find a dung beetle. No anything yet. We need to find scat. So now we're on a poop patrol. That's what we're going to be doing now. I don't know if I've ever been on one of those before so this is the first time for me and perhaps it's a first time experience for you too. So we'll hold hands and we'll look for animal feces and then hopefully we're going to find dung beetles. That's the plan anyways. I'm trying to be a positive Patricia about this whole situation because I got the world's easiest board today. Oh, let's have a quick look at something. I have to gain, have to peel myself out of the car because it's warm, so you, you stick to it. What do I have on the board again? I know this is a little bit sad, right? However, this was the most daring dung beetle of them all, as you can see. It dared so much that it died. And now it is just bits and pieces, as you can see. But it is a dung beetle, and it's great because look at this whole ecological system that's going on here. Now the ants have come in, and they um, aren't able to, of course, uh, remove this hard, chitinous uh, structure. Um, but they were, of course, all well, their skeletons on the outside, as I'm sure you all know. But um, they were able to just remove the inside, so it's kind of hollowed out now. Look, I'm gonna just open it. Look, there's nothing. There's nothing left. It literally, it dared its life away. So please let me know if I get daring dung beetle. And little dung beetle, I'm really sorry that you had to sacrifice, sacrifice yourself for us. Um, well, no, I didn't, don't think I drove over you. This has happened quite a while ago. It could have been a buffalo that squashed it. It could have been an elephant, a rhinoceros, and once, I've even seen an impala stab a dung beetle with its horns. I have never seen that. That's not happened. But it would be, imagine that sighting. That would be a crazy thing. My money would be on the dung beetle, though. Um, so, yes. So, you're just going to have to let me know, hopefully, if I get that. Dung beetle is confirmed. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm so happy. Let's go find an impala. Welcome back. We are really bumbling around here. We come across with one of the most uh, 
loud uh, Franklins that we have in the area. You may call spare four because it's called red face uh, spare four, which is really reddish in face. And also, in late in the evening, early in the morning, you tend to see them. They singing a very loud, loud songs. And of course, early part of the morning, around four o'clock, you might hear them calling. And the late afternoon, the sounds like kora, kora, kora. You can hear from the distance, especially in a very rocky area and a clay soil area. They really prefer those areas. Those are the red face spare fall, which we it found is very common is everywhere while we were young boys we used to really set up a traps more especially for francolins and we really award i mean we were we were having competition to award who will be catching the most it's not easy to catch a francolin of course you need to be experienced look at that such a beautiful species they, they are always two together, more than two. You find that the crescent francolin, they're always in numbers. But the red face, you normally find them two. Otherwise, mother and the youngster. And of course, with the mouth. Look like there are so much territorial. There's reason you tend to see them calling a lot around in the area. In the evening, late in the afternoon. It's all about um, a territorial display once they make a call around in the area. Let's move and head a little bit more east. We look like we are now uh, able to uh, broadcast. We have technical problem there, but look like sorted out. We are trying to go and check Twin Pants up to the east. Maybe when the lines get to move, we might be able to find them in the area where we can able to broadcast them. So we'll head more to the uh, east a little bit towards the HQ area. Where there's quite a lot of uh, activities of elephant this afternoon. Let's head on those areas. This area is a lot more beautiful and it does have similarities from where I come from, maybe Juma, on those areas. With all these big car uh, cages and quite a lot of time, it's really si there's similar when it comes to habitat itself. Also, the roads that we have here, some of them. You tend to see their names a little bit common for me as a guide it's very easy to learn quickly more especially all the names that uh, all the roads names that it names after animals it's a lot more easy to know those and we'll be really linking to one of the our station i will copy maybe from lauren out there or in juma Thanks, Rexon. Well, if you didn't uh, believe that our previous impalas were dashing, there are some dashing impalas. They're all taking a jog up the airstrip here on Chitwa, doing some drag racing, maybe. And they all seem to be coming. They're incredible how agile these little things are. It blows my mind. Those little tiny legs that they've got that look like as if you could just break them easily with your hands. Well, we probably could, but we obviously wouldn't want to. But how they absorb the impact of... Uh, an animal running at high speed like impalas can do and they can jump they can cover 12 meters in a bound they can jump nearly three meters high uh, very very impressive animal and as we all know very very um successful oh, look at all they come all the lambs look at them go <laughs> Potentially the, the dominant male at the back, who's doing a good job shepherding everybody forwards. But they're all strung out up the airstrip now. A great big line of impalas with this male bringing up the rear. Oh, there's still more coming. Wow. Hundreds of impalas. I think that's officially the first properly dashing impalas that we've got. <laughs> a lot of very good looking male impalas, but look at them all, they're still coming. Huge herd. Look at that little one go! <laughs> a 
A great big caravan of impalas going up the airstrip. Look at that. Still so nice to see these little creches forming as well. Not necessarily in this case, but we've seen a couple now where we've had groups of little ones, about 20 or so strong, that are off doing their own thing, just causing rubbish, I'm sure, being naughty boys and girls. We actually, was it last week? I think we got approached by a little group of, uh, I think it was you and me, wasn't it, Eagle? And we got approached by that little group of um, impala lambs on Aubrey's. They're quite quizzical of us, and then they sort of came towards us, they got to about 15 metres away from us, just all moving as one, obviously emboldened by the fact that they were in a group, uh, and came to have a good look at us. Potential, still one or two females could still be pregnant, there's one or two that do look a little bit uh, chunky. Some late births. Uh, Ian, thanks for that question. Um, again, I'm going to have to give you a ballpark figure, uh, but they'll kind of stay together for a long period of time until they at least sort of a year old. Generally, those individuals stay within that sort of breeding herd unless they get separated. Uh, but we will stop seeing such obvious crashes probably in the next couple of months. Uh, I don't know the exact time scheme that they sort of start to become less gregarious in terms of all the little ones together in those crashes, but I would think after sort of three or four months, uh, but I don't know for sure. But generally speaking, most of the females certainly will stay within the group and the males will split off to form their bachelor herds uh, you know, in between the breeding seasons. And then we saw dogs this morning, or Taylor saw the dogs this morning, uh, and the dogs are a very important vector of breaking these herds up because they do tend to stay together but it's important for any species to have genetic diversity, so it's good to have some immigration and emigration, and that is one of the things that dogs do because of their stamina and their ability to chase these animals for long, long distances. They can completely break up herds or splinter off little groups, which will then either sort of remain on their own or they will migrate and join another herd, and generally speaking, they'll always be accepted. So that's a good way to increase um, the genetic diversity of the species. Uh, dog's not always a bad thing. In the long run, anyway, for an impala. <laughs> All clustering around in the shade. It's still very warm this afternoon. And don't forget, the, uh, the more palatable grasses tend to like shady areas as well. So that's often where you'll find those much bigger, thicker, more lush-looking leaves, uh, because those ones living in the sun tend to be a bit more fibrous because they need to protect themselves. And if you've got great big lush leaves in direct sunlight, chances are you're going to lose a lot of moisture as a plant, uh, which is obviously something you want to try and avoid. Okay, well I'm going to make my way up the airstrip and then round on to Mike's kitchen, which is the uh, that little open area. Uh, the other side of the dam, we'll end up at the dam a bit later, but let's send you over to Taylor. Well, we are hoping to win bingo. We have Impala. He is so beautiful. He is dashing. Look at him as he's, he's so regal. He's glancing over towards us. Isn't that just wonderful? Did you see the way he was flipping his ears back too? I think that that's lovely. It's very nice. So if you would like for me to win bingo today and not be a family disappointment, then uh, you can vote yes. And I obviously got confirmation that I got the most daring dung beetle that ever lived. Even Cedric was quite impressed. I'm quite chuffed with that. Um, he sent me a little personal message. So we'll wait with two stickers. Armed and dangerous. Not really, just with stickers. I uh, have, yeah, you know. So we'll just wait patiently. Am I going to get the confirmation that I need? And then, and then your reward will be I'll stop singing. <laughs> so maybe that's the encouragement that all of you need is for me to actually stop. Dung beetle we know is confirmed. We're just waiting for dashing impala because they are beautiful. And just now Aubrey drove past here and the impala as they do, they did skedaddle a little bit. So they did dash. And impalas are good dashes. They run incredibly fast. 
they dash around for the most time. And if I was a predator, I would not like to try and chase an impala around, especially if um, if you've been spotted, because the way that they leap and bound is quite spectacular. And I'll tell you something else. If you say yes to me, I will take you to go and see Mareeps the leopard. If not, then that's fine. We're going to look at insects for the rest of the afternoon. So it's your choice, really. That's not even a song. So we've got Daring Dung Beetle. Thank you very much. I thought I'd just do it all at once. And finally, Dashing Impala. Yay! Good job, Rian. Woo! The crowd goes wild. And because of that, I will now request to try and get into the Mareep sighting because he's just marched through the entire property. We've just, I've just heard now. I'm waiting for Aubrey to get in there and <laughs> give me clear direction as to where we are supposed to go. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Um, that'll be it from us today. No, hopefully we're going to have more spectacular sightings and spend a bit of time with Mareeps because I haven't really had the opportunity to sit with him and watch him get up to his antics. So I'll turn on the Game Drive radio and inquire. Thank you, Impala. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening. I hope you don't get eaten because you helped me win tonight. Yeah, goodness gracious. That was fun. It was quick and easy. And before... 5.30 Come. All the ladies are coming Jason, while I'm being cinematic <laughs> From the sublime to the ridiculous, everybody, of that ethereal and unattainable thing, the happy marriage. Very nice to see him. <laughs> this is an unbelievable afternoon. Right, I was just doing a loop of Mike's Kitchen, as they call it here on Chitwa, but not much happening other than some more impalas, but I've just seen something in a tree which I'm going to investigate, and you guys can come with me while I do so.
there's a strange little thing attached to a branch. Let's go have a look and see if we can figure out what it is. It might be a little wasp's nest, it could be an ant's nest, but there's only one way to find out. Let's go have a look. You see it? There you go. There we go. Let's have a look and see if we can figure out what's going on here. Okay, so this is a... Ooh, there's lots of sap being released from the tree. This is a black monkey orange. Uh, and this looks very much uh, like a nest from one of our types of potter wasps or mason wasps. You get lots of different species here. I thought it could be a cocktail ant nest, but that would normally be made more out of sort of chewed up uh, fibers and it wouldn't be as smooth and as uh, sort of plastered effects as this one is. There is a hole in the side here, so whether something's already tried to get in there, I'm not sure. But generally speaking, if this follows the same path as the other mason wasps here, what they will do is most of them are uh, hunters of caterpillars, and they sting the caterpillars, par um, paralyze the caterpillars. Then they bring them back into here, and there'll be little chambers in here. Each one will be stocked with some paralyzed but still living caterpillars, and each little chamber will have one larvae, normally suspended from the roof on a little bit of silk and then that egg will develop the larvae will drop down and basically munch its uh, way through those poor caterpillars uh, which cannot move sometimes they'll also use spiders as well the thing i always find really interesting about these parasitic wasps is the way that the larvae know not to eat the vital organs first because that is what's keeping your food supply alive so they generally will eat all the other stuff and then as they get bigger and they want more nutrition and more nu more protein they will then take um, the, the more vital organs, so the, the lungs and the livers and the, the equivalent thereof uh, within those uh, insect sort of prey that they've got. Uh, this will also be parasitized by other things. You sometimes find the what we call a velvet ant, uh, which is a looks like an ant, but it's a, it's a wasp with no wings, basically, or the female, the male flies. Uh, but the female has a sort of purple abdomen with white spots and she looks like an ant and it's furry hence the name velvet ant can give you a nasty sting if you try and accidentally pick one up or, or sit on one or something uh, but they are parasites of these nests and i also the other day actually saw a uh, was it a southern black tit was breaking open these and actually stealing the caterpillars which were inside because that's a perfectly good food source for a little insectivorous bird as well so lots of little intimate relationships going on here but certainly the nest of some sort of potter or mason wasp. I'm not happy to go species specific for you, but very interesting to see. It's not all about the big stuff, as we keep saying. Of course, the most famous ones are those spider hunting wasps, the big blue ones, uh, which go after much larger prey. So they will take things like rain spiders and baboon spiders, which can get to this sort of size, uh, you know, not far off the palm of your hand. Uh, and that's obviously very difficult for those things to drag. So what they tend to do is chew off the legs, paralyze the spider, uh, eat off the legs basically, discard the legs, and then you'll sometimes find them just dragging the body of the spider, just the abdomen and the cephalothorax, which is that front part, minus the legs. And you'll see them dragging them over rocks and obstacles uh, as they take them back to the nest. You get lots of different types of wasps though that are parasitic. It's a very, very diverse family. Uh, there is one also that lays their eggs on caterpillars. Uh, and then when the larvae hatch, they burrow into the caterpillar and the caterpillar is still going around its business doing normal stuff, but being eaten alive slowly. Uh, and then when it's time to pupate, uh, you'll sometimes see a caterpillar with these white little um, sort of, well, eggs on the outside of the body. And that's the little cocoons that the pupa uh, have spun. Uh, before they then break out. And that caterpillar was, will be sitting somewhere out in the open, almost dead. Um, but those uh, little, the adults will then fly off and then you get other caterpillars, which often a lot of them have those little white protrusions on their body because that's a type of mimicry so that any passing parasitic wasp might think, ah, that caterpillar's already been uh, parasitized, so I shall leave it alone. So this whole arms race going on between the smaller things is fascinating. Uh, speaking of an arms race, uh, I believe we've had word that Taylor has won bingo already. So very, very well done, Taylor. Uh, that was pretty quick as well. Uh, but another first victory, so we've got nobody with more than one victory, so the next two days are going to be quite exciting. 
Uh, I think that was from Marcus, Julie, if you could just confirm, but I think the question was why don't they get destroyed in the rain? Uh, it's all to do with the fact that it's not just, they didn't just pick up some wet mud and stick it onto the branch there. They bring it back bit by bit um, and then they mix it a bit like termites do with that special saliva. They've got enzymes in that saliva and it sets a little bit like concrete. Uh, and it's, I wouldn't say it's completely water resistant, but it doesn't disintegrate because of those special enzymes and that sort of glue basically that uh, they add to the mix. And you get lots of different types. You get some which are only this big. I'm sure some of you will have found them on your walls. You get some of them that uh, make those nests in little pipes and things. They'll take any opportunities. Uh, but you get that particular group make these big sort of blobs that you sometimes find attached to branches. And so it's not unusual to find those little velvet ants um, on there. But they're quite a common thing, the velvet ants. I'm just wondering if I've got a picture for you somewhere. Show you pictures of that velvet ant because it's something that people see and go, Ooh, that's pretty, it's a little anti type thing, and then they make the mistake of picking it up and it'll give you a nasty sting. Uh, the males will also sting, but they're much, much smaller, as is often the case. Um, let's have a look. I'll just show you a few examples of the different types of these sort of mud daubery type things that we have here. So you can see these much smaller nests built here. That's on the underside of a leaf, so a very small one. There's one in construction, so you can see how it's being mixed with that specialist saliva. This one's making a more of a tubular structure. Okay, well now we're into paper wasps, so I'll just show you the velvet ant, but ants and wasps are in the same family. They're in the Hymenoptera, no, sorry, not family, uh, the same order, the Hymenoptera order. So there we go, there is a velvet ant here and here. So it's got this sort of purpley black abdomen with little spots on. And again, this is a type of aposematic coloration, black with bright white on it. And you'd think this was an ant, but it can give you a nasty sting. And believe it or not, that's the male. So very, very different from the female. So a flightless wasp, the velvet ant. And then you also get things as normal in nature that mimic velvet ants that are not unpleasant or have stings. And nature is very, very clever. That insect world, I know we keep saying it, but the insect world is just crazy. The more you dig into it, the more weird and wonderful stuff and relationships that you find in there. But let's see what else we can see. I'm also keeping an eye out on these, what I know is the common name of snake bite bush, um, but it's uh, Wolf Wolftheria indica, I think it's his Latin name. Taylor was actually telling me this morning because I saw we had that little mantid that you found that was running around on my dashboard and I mentioned the really pretty flower mantids and she said she often finds the nymphs uh, on those plants so I'm looking for one of those for you as well this afternoon I'm down south from Wolf um, we are just wasting sorry everyone I'm just listening to the game drive radio so i have had to just take one more standby on the uh, I'm not on the in, within the Mareep sighting the landowners of Juma would like to go see him so obviously I'm such a good girl I'm such a great student I said please go ahead before me I'll find some other nonsense to talk about but um, basically I don't know how he's done it because this morning he was all the way on Cheetah Cut Line and then he disappeared down into Torchwood and now he's missioned through the property the whole the afternoon and um, he's found himself here like behind camp basically. I think he's going to eventually pop out at Gallego Pan where, where they're off-roading at the moment it's actually a complete nightmare so I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to go down in there because I don't think it'll be um, good to break a car. And that's kind of the off-roading that will need to be done. So he's slowly moving west. So we'll just let everyone get through and then one of the vehicles is going to have to leave soon because he's been there for quite some time. So I'll start putting some pressure on to get have our chance. He's very patient. Just been sitting here playing a game, trying to win. And um, we'll, we will get our chance. I'm just really confused about all the wild dog tracks that I'm now seeing that I didn't see this morning. So I don't know if the dogs also got up and moved around during the day or if the pack was actually split and we didn't we didn't have all the uh, 
we don't actually know who the pack is. We don't know how many members are in the pack. And I did hear quite a few vocalizations. So this, it's possible that maybe some members were a bit further south and have, you know, maybe run back towards the north. They were, yeah, there were tracks all over Philemon's dip here on Impounded Plains. They weren't there this morning. So interesting. Might uh, be in for another wild dog treat this afternoon. That's what we're going to try for. Just listening to the radio again. I don't know, something was said, but very quietly. Very quietly. Oh no, I said I'd stop singing. I'm actually being quite cheeky now because I'm I'm hovering just on the outskirts here waiting for uh, Maribs to sort of move in this direction but I don't want to get too close to Galago Pan in case he does arrive at Galago Pan and it's not my turn to go in that's a big no-no so I'm just sort of waiting there wasn't really much unfortunately up on on the open plains above camp oh there's a butterfly I'm gonna try and reverse maybe we can look at the butterfly if it doesn't fly just pretend we're not actually oh land somewhere no it was a look like a cabbage white again bye are you gonna sit somewhere nicely nope it looks like it's tempting hmm you can come forward if it's just in front of us walking. penny um i haven't personally i haven't seen wild dogs hunting any other predators per se um, they're not the world's biggest predator, so, you know, they're not going to be like, oh, you know, get, rile everyone up and be like, we're going to go and get us a leopard this afternoon or something along those lines. Um, but I haven't actually ever seen wild dogs interacting with jackal. That would be quite interesting to see. And I'm not sure if, it, uh, if anyone out there has seen it. What happened? Tell us. Share that information with us because I've never seen it before. Uh, so I don't think they'd necessarily want to, to kill them. I think if they were, they might chase a serval or they'll, they just will chase something up the tree. Whether or not they'll eat it, I'm not sure. Maybe if it's small enough. Yes. Again, animals are so opportunistic and they will eat anything. Just because we haven't seen it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And I think that's what happened, uh, you know, many, many, many years ago. And people started writing books on animal behavior. They, our knowledge is still very limited, but it's definitely, uh, we've learned a lot more through technology and, you know, access to wild spaces and habituation of animals, you know, all that type of thing is, has definitely helped us. So, yeah, gosh. I don't, um, I don't really know. I'm just trying to think. I mean, we look at how hyenas and wild dogs interact with each other all the time. This morning we had a very pleasant interaction with Gangrika. She just sort of tipped uh, and touched the nose of another wild dog. Actually, there were two individuals that uh, showed some interest in her, but not anything aggressive. So I suppose they don't always have to be very aggressive uh, encounters. Anyways, we're just going to sit and wait for our opportunity, of course, to head into Marib's. I made a promise I'm going to try and keep it. Or if we go to Ben, he might be sulking now that he didn't win Bingo. Well, well done again, Taylor. That was quite the blitz that you put on that bingo board this afternoon. Congratulations. Uh, which I suppose takes a little bit of the pressure off, although we will still be gunning for second place. But we're doing some birding at Jedra Dam. We're just commenting that these chicanas, we see them every day, but if you actually stop and look at them, they are really, really pretty birds. That little orange wash on the neck, nice bright white, and then that lovely blue sort of casky shield that they have on the top of their heads. And just look at those ridiculous toes, They're like the ultimate clown feet. Like, uh, they're like the Ents from Lord of the Rings, with their tree root feet. But that is why they are often called lily hoppers as well. They have that ability to, with such long toes, the whole, oh, there you get something now. Uh, it just spreads out the body weight and allows them to walk on top of lily pads and things and other floating vegetation. But here, of course, there's not enough uh, for him to be able to walk on the water. Just paddling in the shallows looking for little things, little arthropods. Shane, this one got a fright a minute ago from a hippo. Look at that beautiful. 
beautiful shield on top of his head. You also get a lesser jacana, which I have seen before, but never in South Africa, but they didn't really occur in South Africa. I saw mine when I was working up in East Africa. Uh, but there are two species of, of uh, jacana, this just being the African jacana, and then we also have the lesser jacana as well. If you've seen Jakarta tracks, they they always look like spider webs. Huge toes. Oh, we found something there. But there'll be plenty of food in these shallows so after a little bit of rain that we've had. Lots of little arthropods to be feeding on. You can see them probing into the, the mud there. You might have just heard a laughing hippo in the background. If you did, do let me know, because I do need a laughing hippo. Uh, sorry, Chili, you broke up whilst you were giving me that question. I think I heard it was from Vaughan, uh, but I didn't get the question. Uh, sorry, Judy, I think we've got a bit of a comms issue there. I'm just getting very broken messages. It was something about the colour. I've got a guess for maybe your question was, do those colours mean anything or do they signify something? Is there a specific reason? Uh, apparently Igor got your comms. I did not. Um, I don't think so specifically because fe females and males are very similar in coloration. Uh, there's no great difference. Um, and normally speaking, in birds, the male is more brightly coloured, but as many of you may know, the African jacana is one of the very few species of birds, of which only about 1% of the 10,000 species worldwide are polyandrous, which means the female is bigger and often more brightly coloured, uh, because polyandrous means that a female will mate with multiple males. So a female will enter the fray, uh, a male will inseminate her, uh, and then when she lays the eggs, she leaves the male to look after the eggs, and she goes off and finds another male, and will have multiple clutches with multiple males during one breeding season. Uh, but there is no obvious dimorphism in terms of the coloration between males and females. The only difference is, uh, is size. So quite why they've developed that blue shield on the top of their head, I, I couldn't actually tell you. Possibly, I'm just thinking out loud, maybe blue is a good thing for reflection of UV rays from the sun, just a, just a thought, uh, but I really don't know for sure, I've never heard of a, a particular theory. But that just, those feet are amazing, crakes are the same, you can see he's just sort of walking on top of that sort of scummy weed that's growing there. And he's not sinking into the water there, it's just spreading his body weight so well. Skeletal hands, aren't they? If we're lucky enough to see a male with some chicks, they're always. Oh, I tell you what, there's something a bit different. There's a pied wagtail eager on this dead branch here. We don't normally. I well, haven't framed a pied wagtail for a long time. There we go. Black and white. Remember anything with pied in the name suggests black and white. You have a caged pied barbet. You have a pied starling always with blacks and whites. And then you can see why it's called a wagtail. Again, both sexes do that. Quite why, nobody really knows, but it's a very much a, a trait of the family and obviously the etymology behind the name of the wagtail. We also get Cape wagtails, but not really so much in this area. If you go to Johannesburg or a little bit more to the high fields, you'll find lots of Cape wagtails. You actually find them uh, not necessarily associated with water. These pied wagtails normally associated with water. The Cape wagtails you find in the middle of Johannesburg, in the middle of cities. They've kind of learnt to scavenge, unfortunately. You often find them around sort of cafes and things. And you get them on Penguin Beach as well, the, the Cape wagtails. There are a few other wagtails that I'm yet to see, actually. There's a couple that you could see.
the end of another year here at Wild Earth. And what a year it has been. Escape to Nature and the Wild Show were born along with our brand new app. We couldn't be happier to welcome back James, Steve and Lauren in the new year who once again will be part of the permanent team. We are grateful to every single one of you who has watched Wild Earth this year and a very big thanks to our explorers. Without you, none of this would be possible. Happy holidays. Okay, well we're definitely doing some birding here. We've now got a beautiful water thickney. It's a bird that we see regularly here, but we don't probably don't pay it enough attention, but they're very easily missed. That camouflage is incredible. Uh, and they're generally more active uh, sort of dawn and dusk uh, and during the night time as well. So they're what we consider either nocturnal or crepuscular. A crepuscular animal is more active dawn and dusk. But very, very aggressive and fearless little things. They just make little scrape nests in the ground and well known to defend that uh, nest best they can. They put their wings out and they've got these little white windows on their wings and they walk down with their wings outstretched, squawking and squeaking, uh, trying to intimidate any animal that comes too close. I've seen them do it with buffalo, with elephant. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the, they're generally ignored, but they have absolutely no fear at all. stilt like legs you can see why it's called a thick knee you can see that sort of bulge on the the leg there which of course isn't a knee don't forget that is an ankle Tesha, it is a lovely afternoon of birding now that Taylor's won bingo the uh, whilst to say we will most definitely be vying for second place but it takes a little bit of the pressure off and we could enjoy some of the uh, lesser appreciated aspects of the bush Oop, do you hear that little cheap? Look at the size of that eye as well. I said it's a nocturnal bird. So it's got a very large eye to help get enough light into that pupil. I'm not sure if you've heard any of our laughing hippos. We have had some hippos laughing in the background, but they are probably quite far away. Uh, Darren, well, to be the simple answer is they'll go to a different water source. Uh, you know, they're not necessarily restricted to a source, and uh, they themselves, they're not going to drink fetid water. They'll, they'll should know if it's unpleasant. Um, and a lot of insect life, a lot of arthropod life, is a good indicator of good quality water. And in fact, if you're actually going to do 
um, studies on water quality there's, there's actually a very sort of interesting index that you can get and you you go and capture little arthropods there um, and then you see what you've captured and then you can compare it to a list and it will say that you know if you've got this one your water quality is good if you haven't got much of this it's not so good if you heard that laughing hippo in the background um, so quite simply a bird if the if there are pollutants around the food will disappear and the birds will go elsewhere Uh, other than that, I'm not sure what else they, they can really do. Of course, we know a little blacksmith lapwing there as well. Seeing there's something white in the background, I think it's probably a grey heron. Check. Yeah, a distant grey heron. I'm just doing a quick scan with my binoculars. It looks like an egret at the back there, Eagle. Do you see that? behind the Egyptian geese, right on the other side. Looks like an egret of sorts. There, there it is. Little family of Egyptian geese in the foreground there. They're very far away from us, but that is one of the egrets, probably a cattle egret or maybe a little egret. I'm just going to try and see if I can get a closer look with my binoculars. tell from there. You think it's cattle? We will go with cattle until proven otherwise because we do occasionally do get cattle egrets here. They move around um, and follow, often following large animals a bit like the drongos do and some of the starlings uh, to make the most of those insects which are being dislodged. But this one apparently is just enjoying an afternoon by the pool. did see some Egyptian geese gosling somewhere, but not those ones, I don't think. This one off to the right, but I don't see them now. But there was a little family close to where the rest of the hippos hang out on the other side of the dam. Okay, well I know Taylor was going to head to the east to see if she could follow up on Marips, who was briefly seen as a part of that dog sighting this morning, so let's go and see if she's had any fortune that side. No, we've had no luck, not even a little bit, and it's been quite difficult to try and navigate um, all of this, unfortunately. Uh, Maribs obviously was lost in this very dense vegetation, and I, I mean, it's very easy to lose a leopard here. So I've still got the game drive radio going. I'm just listening. So we're just basically playing a game of wait now. I don't want to try and bundu bash so horrifically through a drainage line for no reason and not potentially get a view of the leopard. So they said he was coming down in this direction, um, and Maribs bit of a distance away you'll be so shocked as to how quickly uh, these cats or animals can move through the bush when they want to and it's yes it's slow for us because we've got lots of challenges of vehicles and that um, uh, rocks and logs that we have to navigate around and you know try and squeeze between trees so I'm hoping that we're going to just hear an alarm call and that will give us a an idea I can hear the guides one guide that's still trying to follow up on him um, so yeah, we're just going to wait. But if he's going to carry on marching through this dense vegetation, there's no ways we can follow him. Like you can see, it's it's in there. It's kind of really nice and open. It's a bit difficult to see, but it's actually quite lovely. But everywhere else, there's tamboti trees, there's guari bushes, there's young leadwoods, there's bush willows. It's very, very difficult. So I'm just trying to hear where everyone is. So this is what we're going to do. We're literally just going to sit here and wait. In case you have forgotten and you haven't heard it enough, you can join for a fireside chat on the 7th of January where we will 
reminisce about the days that uh, Inkanyeni ruled the eastern sector of uh, the northern part of the Sabi Sands. Please remember to put that in your calendar, set an alert. We'd love for you to uh, join us. It would be wonderful. Um, Mareeps, if you can also pop out now, because we're trying to be very patient here. I don't think he's going to go north. I think he's going to keep coming south. I'm, you know, my my hope is that he's going to arrive at Gallego Pan, where we can have a nice open view of him. I can't hear any vehicles now. It's gone very quiet, but I don't think that they've um, got a view. No, radio. Why are you not working? No, I don't think I maybe have signal now on the. Oh, there we go. Uh, station looking for Mareeps for Taylor. Have you had any luck? I'm just sitting up on a high crest looking down into the drainage line, um, hoping to hear alarm calls or get a view of him from, from Gallagher Shortcut. Nope, we might be the only ones. Oh well. Very quiet. No alarm calls can be heard. Not a squirrel, not a bird. Right, off you go back across to Chitwa with Ben and hopefully he's having a little bit more luck than we are. Uh, not much happening this side either, Taylor, if I'm honest. Um, but we have our ever-present groups of hippos in the water and I say, still do need a laughing hippo so <laughs> right on cue I hope you all heard that laughing hippo and another one okay I think that is fairly comprehensive if somebody would like to confirm multiple laughing hippos in fact, do we have two? We have two laughing hippos on our board. There were so many laughs there, surely we can get two stickers for that. There's no prizes for second place, of course, but we're going to try regardless. A couple of juvenile oxpeckers on this hippo here. You can see they haven't developed their red beak yet. The one on the right, you can still see a little bit of that yellowish tinge to the beak, which is suggesting they're less than only a, well, only a couple of months old. The other one well, they're both beginning to go black, which normally happens after about three months, I believe, before they develop the red during that first year. And there's a green-backed heron on that uh, branch behind. One with the hippo resting his chin on. There's a little green-backed heron having a fish as well. It's actually very cool to run into that um, hippo out of the water the other afternoon when it was drizzly and quite cool. The hippos came out early that day and we bumped into Dewey in the Mulawati. <laughs> the hippo doing his bit to uh, add some organic material back to the water. Very, very important, of course, to be able to do that. Take some of that nutrients from dry land into the water and the fish will benefit from that as well. Mobile fish feeding service. Of course, it is one of the main ecological roles of hippos is to be that sort of link to bring that organic material from the land into the water so that all the aquatic life can benefit from it. And the other thing they do, of course, is keep waterways open by moving around on the ground. They keep stirring up the silt uh, and they prevent great build-up of uh, deposition of soil being carried through. So somewhere like the Okavango Delta, of course, with all those little sort of tendrils of um, 
waterways. If it wasn't for the hippo population there, those waterways would all close up because of deposited material there. Their constant activity keeps those waterways open and they are one of the driving forces of that whole Okavango Delta ecosystem. I'm watching that heron carefully because those grey herons have been known to actually use tools um, in order to facilitate their hunting. I was actually watching a thing on crows. There's a, the, I think it's the New Caledonian crow is considered to be the most intelligent bird on the planet. Um, and it uses tools with multiple parts and it's able to solve relatively complex problems and also no, will choose a delayed better reward than an instant gratification, which is very rare in the animal kingdom. Um, and they're actually, in this little thing I was watching, they compared their intelligence in terms of those sorts of tests to that of a seven-year-old human being, uh, which is incredible for a bird. But uh, these herons have been known to catch little insects and then drop the insect in the water and use it like bait and wait for a fish to come up. And uh, when the fish goes for the bait, the heron will grab the fish and there have even been records that if they can see a fish that they don't want or a fish that isn't big enough about to take the bait, they'll quickly whip the bait out of the water so they don't waste it and then put it back again once that fish has gone. So it seems to be some sort of selection of uh, prey as well. So we tend not to think of birds being very intelligent because they don't have very big brain mass to the size and sort of body ratio. Uh, because most of their skull is made up with eyes. Uh, but it just goes to show, some birds are a lot more intelligent than we think. Ravens, crows, magpies, things in that uh, Corvidae family in particular. But I think actually, I think we called it a greenback heron. It, like many other bird names, have changed. It's now known as a striated heron, I believe. Uh, Shannon, that's a good question. And the answer is they give birth in the shallows, so they do give birth in water. Uh, they're also one of the very few mammals that suckle underwater as well. Um, often the female will lie in the shallows and the, uh, the calf will lie under the water and still attach its mouth around the mammary gland and be able to drink uh, by creating a, a proper seal around the teat there and it's quite happy feeding underwater as well. See some nasty scratches and slash marks on this one's back. Very normal in hippos, they do squabble a lot particularly when water starts to become at a premium during the dry season when it starts to dry up. Still hoping that we see this kingfisher make a dart for something. Uh, often they will actually sort of stab and impale a fish on one of those mandibles. Otherwise we'll just grab it uh, like a pair of tweezers and bring it back and you'll often see them smacking the, uh, the fish around uh, on that log just to get rid of some of those scales and just to stun the fish before very cleverly manipulating it without dropping it, hopefully, uh, head first and then swallowing it whole. You'll find that almost all things will swallow fish head first because otherwise uh, the fins, those pectoral fins and the dorsal fins and things, uh, you're sort of going against the grain and you run a much bigger risk of getting something stuck in your throat. I don't know if you want to try for that wire-tailed swallow, Igor. It might be a bit far away. Do you see right at the top of this dead tree on the far right, to the right of that uh, rightmost nest? There's a little wire-tailed swallow sitting up there, one of our resident swallows that's here all year round. He's quite small and it's a bit far away, but you might be able to see something. Yeah, there he is. Oh, you can just make that. You should be able to see that they've got that red cap. That's very distinctive, the white on the chin, and then that red cap shows you it's a wire-tailed swallow. And they're one of the ones, the few swallows that we actually see all year round, and you'll see them 
darting across the water in the middle of winter as well. I was asked a question the other day about migratory swallows and so we have all sorts of different swallows here. These ones are resident then we have intra-African migrants, we also have Palearctic migrants, so pretty much all types of migration represented by the swallow group over here in Back southern in Africa. Everybody having a nice groom. Some twitchy wings going on. What a lovely afternoon of birding. Welcome back. Uh, we are joining back with this uh, Ngati Pride. Look like they're getting active a little bit here. They might get up and move at any time. So the lions, in the course of a day, because it was very hot, know that uh, from here they might head in a direction water source. And of course, because they're very famous, they really ambush around the water. They know that all the impala, zebra, giraffe, and all different sorts of species, it is now a time for them to head down to the water. As you find them, they can now. They don't want to We'll be linking Taylor, which is small. So, sorry, I'm pointing. I'm like a German short-haired pointer pointing at something. But the something is a paper wasp nest. I actually just stumbled into that uh, by mistake. Do you see it? Um, I can't see it on the camera. There, try there. Yeah, there we go. There it is. That thing. You might have to get a nice close look. Um, yeah, it looks wasps. I actually pulled off the road because Aubrey was coming past me <laughs> as I pulled off. This caught my attention. Now I know you're all disappointed that I don't have Marebs, but unfortunately he get, he's given everyone the slip and I'm unable to get off the car and go and track him and try and relocate him. I have to stick to the vehicle. Um, so I'm really just going to drive around roads but aimlessly. I would have loved to have just sat in one place and obviously just uh, listened because I think he is coming down that drainage line and it's only a matter of time but anyways we'll carry on um yeah so paper wasps how cool i'm actually a bit nervous that i'm sitting so close to them so we won't stay for too long um it looks like they've i'm trying to see but it's hard because you you're not really close and where's my binoculars i can see much better with my binoculars so i'm going to use those so give me one second to see what's going on amazing so they are very busy. There's one that looks like it's cleaning itself. They look like there's some cells that are closed and I'm not sure if they had, if they've got pupa in there perhaps. Some of them look like they've broken open. Maybe they, the larvae is. Uh, can you talk to me on out? the Jimmy channel? Sorry, I'm turning that down. I don't need to worry too much about the back game drive radio right now unless I mention the word Marie's. But very cool. Very, very busy. Most adults uh, of wasps, they particularly feed on things like nectar and pollen and high sugar goodies. But oh, there's a lot of, you see, there's actually a lot that's going on a little bit higher up on the, on the nest. But it's a bit difficult to see because it's hidden behind all the leaves. The adults up there seem to be very busy. And I don't know if they're maybe feeding some of the pupa. I mean, the larvae that are inside there, or what the story is. Anyway, it's a bit difficult to see. Let's not disturb them too much more. Okay, we'll do a couple of little 
drives around and hopes to find something. If we go to Ben, who's now doing some birding. Thanks, Taylor. Well, we're still doing some birding. We moved away from the dam on Chitwood. We've got a nice little group of helmeted guinea fowls, which are fussing around in the grass here. You can just see those little blue heads. <laughs> they're rushing around. We're not quite sure what's bothering them, but they're running around in circles. There's probably a male somewhere chasing them. Oh, that was probably the male coming in. Yeah, that's the male. You can see that where he's got his wings raised like that. It's known as a humpback display. He's basically just causing issues and chasing the females around. Oh, they're going to go behind the car. You can tell the males from the females just by looking at the size of that cask, which is that sort of... <laughs> Look at him go! Oh, maybe we've got two groups here that are having a bit of a spat. Uh, the male's cask is normally uh, longer than the female. That's that little sort of bony keratin protrusion on the top of their head. <laughs> uh, which is thought to potentially help with amplification of their call. A very characteristic... <whistles> That's the standard sort of contact call of a helmeted guinea fowl. We call it the squeaky wheelbarrow. It sounds like someone pushing a wheelbarrow that needs a good oil. Of course, we also do get the... Oh, look, there's a, there's a butterfly, Igor. We need a fluttering butterfly. Let's quickly tick that one off while we're here. That only leaves us with a dust basic spur fowl for at least a, a second place finish. So come to the bonox flitting around in the grass here. Let's see if we can grab one for you. Where did it go now? Typical, it landed, and we need a fluttering. Uh, Helen, in the, the helmeted guinea fowls, uh, it doesn't seem so. There's not a great deal of difference in the coloration, but generally speaking in birds, uh, yes. So we're still trying to find you a fluttering butterfly. Uh, so, yeah, most most of the time the males or the more dominant of the two... Uh, oh, good work, Igor. There's an African monarch hiding in the grass. We just need, to, need for it to take off and then we'll claim it. Oh, that's, that's fluttering, surely. Flexing his wings. Um, so yes, normally, there we go, fluttering butterfly. Uh, normally used in sexual selection, uh, so except there are uh, exceptions, such as those Africa Chicana we were looking at. Um, the coloration is no different in males and females, but take the greater, paint, greater painted snipe, uh, which we is seen rarely here, but does occur here. There the female is bigger and more brightly colored because she mates with multiple males. Uh, we also saw a paradise wider the other day with those long tail streaming feathers, uh, very much as an attractant for the females. Uh, and they will then lose those feathers during the winter months and go into what we call their eclipse plumage. So definitely um, bright colours for sexual selection. And we know that birds see in colour, which is why they bother to develop these lovely bright colours. But please do confirm those butterflies are fluttering. And that just leaves us with a dust bathing, dust bathing spur fowl for a well-deserved second place on our bingo board. Oh, there's a knob-billed duck. Comb duck. And an Egyptian goose in the background. A bit like the, uh, the guinea fowl with a big cask on the head, that sort of keratiny lump. You can see it there. So that's a male. You can see that huge, great big lump almost like a massive nail on his beak there again not really sure what it's for but males have them and not females so one assumes it is something to do with selection purposes and again will probably act as a, a resonance chamber for the call but i think it's more of a visual stimuli Oh, and a monkey in the background. Do we need a mischievous monkey? Oh, 
Uh, yesterday I needed a mischievous monkey, but there's a couple of vervet monkeys moving right at the back. But you can see we're quite close to Chitwa. And unfortunately, where there are people, there are usually monkeys because monkeys take advantage of our rather dirty habits of leaving stuff lying around everywhere. All right, butterflies are fluttering, confirmed. Thank you very much. Igor, shall we give a quick board update? Okay, just as a, an update, still vying for second place. We'll try and make it a clean sweep clean sweep for Juma this afternoon. This was the line that I had uh, highlighted this afternoon and we're just missing this dust bathing spur fowl. So hopefully we'll pick one of those up a little bit later this afternoon. Coming late afternoon is a good time for uh, birds to be dust bathing in the road. Okay, I'm going to continue my search for a dust bathing spur fowl and anything else, all creatures great and small, let's send you over to Wrexham and see what's happening at Pridelands. Sorry, I thought we'd gone to Pridevans, but it seems you're still with me. Okie dokie. Well, we're going to head back, I think, back towards Juma, uh, coming to late afternoon now, so maybe we get some activity at Twin Dams or Treehouse Dam, because there was nothing happening when I went past there this afternoon. Oh, look at the five inches. We're doing some birding first, though. Do you see the five inch there? The Jameson's five inch, actually sitting, oh, he was sitting very nicely. I think he just dropped down a little bit. There, he's at the back. Just see him through. There he is. Look, look, look. Or is that a Jam? No, that's a red-billed firefinch. I think I see a red beak there. Uh, yeah, there's a female at the bottom, and that's a male red-billed firefinch. Very nice. You can see that pinkish bill and that yellow ring around the eye. Uh, yesterday we saw a couple of purple indigo birds. Uh, those are, well, the indigo birds in general are the parasites or the brood parasites uh, of the five finches. We get the red build, we get the African five finch, and the Jameson's five finch, and each of them have got a different uh, brood parasite that uh, parasitizes their nests. And so we've got the dusky indigo bird, the purple indigo bird and uh, the village indigo bird. Now the red build, I think, is... Um, blah, 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 which one is the red build? I think it's the village. Yes. So have a quick look here so you can see how you can uh, identify the different indigo birds, if you like, because all three of them occur here and they are all very, very similar. You need to look at the beak and the legs and the combinations of colours. So the purple indigo bird saw yesterday is up here, has a white beak and also sort of white pinkish legs. Uh, then we've got the village indigo bird has red beak and red legs and then the dusky indigo bird has red legs and a white beak so those are the three that we see here so you've got to check the beak and you've got to check the legs and each one parasitizes one of those species of fire finch so purple indigo bird for the jamesons the village indigo bird parasitizes the red build that we've just seen and the dusky parasitizes the african fire finch so very host specific brood parasites that was nice. I think that's the first red-billed firefinch that I've shown you since I've been at Wild Earth. Okay, we'll try that again. This time we're going to try and send you to Lauren and Medicway. We have got a very sleepy male lion. Yes, I believe Miss Taylor McCurdy has already won bingo, but... Oh, oh, oh. First piece of movement in a while. 
But we have Lion on our bingo board. So if we're still playing, then this is another one for us. It's going to push us up to three in a row. This is actually one of the blonde maned Mahiwa, he's called. And we have seen him many times before in the East. So he's one of the dominant males in this area, part of a coalition. He's obviously on his own right now. <laughs> but I just feel a bit stressed about how he's lying. Half his body's very much tucked in the shade. <laughs> but that blonde mane definitely isn't. It must be hot. It is so hot. Davi and I have tried to position ourselves. We're a little bit out the sun. It is just... I mean, it's already... Oh, my goodness. It's ten past six, Davi. He also looks shocked. It's late. Ten past six, and the temperatures are this high. Come on, this is our blondie, I guess. Not blondie Evoca, of course, but this is our blondie here in Medikwe. Turn around, my boy. Oliver, for sure, honestly, they, they really are bigger than the Avocas. I'm not sure about all the other male lions in the sands. Now, I've been gone from Juma for quite a while, and I'm not sure about the S8 male. I saw him a few times, but... The male lines in Mizikwe absolutely are bigger. They are. They're just magnificent. Not that the ones in the sands are not, but there's definitely a different sort of gene pool here in terms of size. Um, Sleepyhead, would you like to turn back around again, please? We've had some really wonderful lion sightings during our time here. And Medikwe is renowned for lions. They have a really high population of lions. They do have a lot of cheetah as well. They do have a lot of leopard. The leopards are just extremely elusive. So I will wait to see if I get my lion confirmed. But we are going to sit with them a little bit longer.
Still absolutely zero movement, but we had some nice weaver activity. In. Oh, we also have confirmation. Okay, I have three in a row. Enormous elephant, lions, and my impal. Yes. So in order to even think about getting second place, I have to find jackals and mongoose. Jackals we can do. I'm sure of it. Mongoose mm, may be tricky. I can't remember what I was going to say there. I was going to say something. Ah, yes, this nest, Dobby, if you see just above our gorgeous male lion, that sort of cluster in the tree there on the right-hand side. This is actually the white-browed sparrow weaver nest. And it's a similar concept to the sort of southern masked weaver, for example. But they're much messier. You can see they sort of just look like clusters hanging from the tree, but they're actually nests that are made by a different species of weaver. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Nope. I do think we will move the car in just a moment and at least try and get a look at his face. But there definitely is relief in the air, I can feel it. It's still very hot, but there's a little bit of relief. So what I'm hoping is that our boy gets up and I think he'll call. He's a dominant male, a territorial male and he's on his own. So he's definitely gonna call. He wants to know where his boys are at. Shall we head around, Dobby? What do you think? Jerry, yes, absolutely, absolutely. 100%. So normally it's actually been proven by science that it's normally the first male that starts mating with the female that is the father of all the cubs. However, they absolutely do share and it can work on, on such a number of different levels. For example, sometimes it's actually the female that sneaks away. She's the one that decides, I don't want to just mate with one male. I'm not monogamous. I want the best genes for my offspring. So she'll wait until either he is just so exhausted. He'll give up, he'll be too exhausted to continue mating, and then a coalition mate will come in. So the male wants to be that first male lion on the scene with her. But absolutely, they will take any that they can get. Okay, we're right now, Dobby. Can you work with this? There we go, now we can see his face. So as we sit in our new position, we are gonna send you guys over to Cedric. Yes, Lauren, nice that you got that uh, male line there at Madikwe. Fortunately, I uh, uh, just lost a little bit of a, a signal there, we do apologize. But yeah, we are at uh, Kukuyu at the moment. And it is fairly quiet at the moment. I was actually hoping for that uh, black rhino to come down here for the late afternoon drink. But unfortunately, no sign of that uh, black rhino. But yeah, first of all, congratulations to Tyler. Tyler, well done on your bingo. That is absolutely wonderful. I'm glad that you got that uh, bingo board, uh, one of the lines filled up there. Definitely smashed that one this afternoon. So yes. But yeah, we've just got a couple of uh, zebras just coming through and um, it seems like it's a little bit of a cloudy afternoon around here yeah, in Namibia. Not too much uh, sunshine for the late afternoon. I thought we are going to have a nice uh, sunset. And it, really, it hasn't happened for this area. 
Let's nice just holding thumbs here. Oh, we got a jackal. We got a jackal. We got a jackal. I oh, just saw a jackal running across on the other side, heading towards the zebras. Definitely always been fortunate with these blackback jackals coming through here. Uh, and uh, always got this, this, little, this pair that comes onto to the Okokuyo pan. I just want to see what is it going to be up to. Zebras are not too, not too phased about that jackal. He's a small predator, so I don't really mind too much about that. Great old jackals, just kind of uh, working out exactly what those zebras want to do. But he wants to, so he wants to try and sneak around them and head to the other side. But it's nice to see them around this side. I think that's uh, especially the late afternoon. I think what they do, they do come here late afternoon once all all things have uh, passed by uh, during the daytime and uh, maybe um, seeing if there is any opportunity of something to. Uh, scavenge on. Looks like this backpack jacket is now. Not going to hang around for too long. But anyways, let's go over to Lauren to see what's happening. Epicness over though. Wow. I thought it's a very loud roar. My goodness, boy. I felt that vibrating through every cell in my body. Oh, you've been so territorial. He'll definitely call again. Once he wakes up some more. He's starting to get restless though. You start to see the signs that they are themselves are waking up. Okay, so my next mission is not to win bingo, but to hear this boy roar again. It's quite something when a female lion does it next to the vehicle, but ooh, when it's a male lion. And this boy is amazing. He's got a mane like no other. It's really blonde. Obviously, his name blonde mane, but he's really, really blonde. And we are now, we've jumped from the northwest corner of Brazil, we're now in the northeast. And he's very much part of the coalition here that dominates the northeast. There was two challengers that I believe came in not so long ago. So they've got to fight for the territory. Territory isn't, isn't just given to you. It isn't just a case of, oh, here's a nice piece of land. Come on, boy. I know you've got it in you. Okay, we're grooming now. Oh, 
Although they are focused when they first arrived in 2018, the area that they sort of set up shop was actually available. The Birmingham boys had left it very vacant, so there wasn't much of a challenge there for the Avocas, which went against them in the end. But even if the land is handed to you on a plate, you've got to fight to keep it yours. There will always be competitors. Boy, thank you so much. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Not you, Darby. I'm talking to the lion. You just feel that specialized voice box. You can feel the vibrations. I'm sure you can feel it just listening wherever you are in the world right now. But sitting here, you can literally feel your body vibrate. You can feel the sound. We were talking about that this morning. And that's why their voice box is not ossified. That's why their voice box is made from mostly cartilage. And that's why it just vibrates and vibrates and vibrates to send that sound extremely far and wide. He's a tired boy. Don't think it's from the roar, though. But yes, he is a tired, tired boy. Many yawns. He's probably going to flop back down at some point. But the roaring actually just is an adaptation from a respiratory function. It's just inhaling and exhaling. It's producing a sound on the exhale. So it is, it is an adaptation, but it is just respiratory function. So it shouldn't take too much out of him. Not a big boy like this one. Look at this golden light as well. Sometimes it's nice to just sit and watch him. Now that he's awake. Look at that mane, so bouncy. What conditioner do you use? Oh, I need to find out. Anyway, we're definitely going to stay with this boy longer. But Miss Taylor would like to show you the sunset. Isn't this gorgeous? The silhouetted trees and the sun. The sun has actually just popped down behind the clouds now, unfortunately. But there is a little bit of an orange glow, which is quite beautiful. And let's play a little game. Can you guess where I am? 
where on Juma am I situated? It's a place that I have constantly been talking about the entire, actually every single day. I spend a lot of time here. Let's see if any of you, of course, can send through those answers. I'll be very impressed if you get it on the first go. So hear the ring neck dove. That ring neck dove is singing its heart out. The part is pretty good. I'm still just listening out, hoping that we're going to hear some kind of alarm call somewhere from something. But uh, we seem to have been hot out of luck. I might have used all my luck this afternoon on the bingo game. That is a possibility for sure. But I'm still going to do a few more laps around where Marie's was lost in hope that we'll get a glimpse of him. Okay, wonderful. We're going to carry on now and uh, go driving. But hopefully you'll all guess where we were. Look, it looks like I was in night time. Obviously, we have to change the exposure, as you can imagine, to highlight that uh, sunset. It looked like it was a lot darker than what it actually is. Although the, the sun's setting pretty quickly. No, oh, there's a road. I can drive on that one. Sorry, I was going to do like a big loop around, but it's not necessary for me to do that. Hello, wildebeest. He's a bit far away. There's a few impala. Oh, look at the dung beetles. Actually, who was here? Let me, sorry, let me just turn the vehicle slightly. Look at them all. Boom. Need really need to work on their landing. Anyways, you can see how the ground has been flattened. This is from the wildebeest that was most likely rolling around in the, in the sand. Um, or maybe he was just having a siesta here. And the dung beetles are going to leave no trace of any dung from that wildebeest, which I think is amazing. And I must be honest, I'm going to just let you on a little bit of a secret of uh, living in the low felt with animals, is that I have not had to pick up my dog Tucker's poop. I'm trying to know if I'm allowed to say that. If it's for a dog, surely I'm allowed to say that. If I was South African, I'd say poo, not poop. We don't say poop. Anyways, uh, I don't have to do that anymore because the dung beetles come in and before I can even get the little shovel uh, and then it's gone, which is amazing. I love summer. It's so great. Especially when you see how much that dog eats. It's ridiculous. He eats a lot of food. Um, he's a big dog though, big puppy. So yeah, dung beetles are very busy there. They're, a couple of them have got some nice neat little balls. They're packing them nice and tightly. Some of them look like they've tried to roll them already and fallen apart. There's one on the, sorry, I'm going to point it at that one there. That's really a terrible looking ball. That's not very nice at all. I'm giving it, I don't know, is that helping a little bit? Some subtle lighting with my torch. Just a, like a smidgen while it's so light. But still busy, pack, pack, packing away. Very busy. They don't stop. I wonder how tired dung beetles get from working that hard every single day. Yeah, that's not round. You need to go back to primary school and learn your shapes, Mr. Dung Beetle or Mrs. Dung Beetle. You're going to definitely need to f smooth out some of those edges. It's kind of oval now. It's a bit like a, an egg shape, if you will, which doesn't roll very well. You're not going to be able to roll it. You're going to try anyways? Okay. Right, that's going to be interesting. Good luck. I don't think you're going to get very far. And if you're trying to impress any of the female dung beetles, you are not going to be in luck because the other dung beetles rolled a much better ball than you. But whatever works, you do you. Who am I to judge? I'm not even a dung beetle. I've never rolled a dung ball in my entire life. So I suppose it's a bit cheeky of me. Anyways, bye dung beetles. Enjoy. There better not be any of that left. Okay, we're just going to have a little look around and see what we're going to do. Ben's doing exactly the same thing. He's back on Juma and I know he's been 
desperate to try and find a leopard, so maybe Tlalamba will pop out for him. <laughs> well, I'm always hoping to find a leopard. You guys should know me by now. I, I, we shouldn't get too obsessed with leopards, but it's very difficult when they're just as pretty as they are. But we've got something for you in this tree here, and we're going to we're going to slowly zoom into it and see how long it takes you to spot what we're looking at, because it's quite an unusual angle to see this thing. That's a very slow zoom, Eagle. But <laughs> But it was a, another inspired spot by Igor. We actually stopped to look at a little waxbill nest uh, to see if there was anybody home. Uh, and then Igor noticed this. And here we go. We've got a flap-necked chameleon, but we're kind of looking down his body. So his head is just sort of behind the leaves. Um, you'll see if the eyes move to us at some point. There we go, there's a bit of movement. That's one of the eyes on the on the right. So his head's sort of looking directly at us, but his eyes are looking off to the side. There we go, there's a pupil. You just saw it very briefly with those fused eyelids. Of course, they don't have upper and lower eyelids like we do. They've just got that one eyelid which is fused shut. And somewhere in there is a little nictitating membrane because they can't blink like we can. That nictitating membrane sweeps across the eye and just removes any dust and any other build-up of rubbish that gets into that little aperture-like pupil. We can easy one of his eyes at the moment. And also we were just commenting a strange colour. I mean, you can see he's rather grey and black in coloration, which is unusual. Normally, even during the daytime, they are more green. Uh, so it's potentially my theory for this. It doesn't look like a, a pregnant female, because she would be a bit wider than that if she was gravid and carrying eggs. Uh, my theory on this is that it is a male sort of displaying because they're not known to camouflage as such, whereas they, they won't necessarily just adopt the background coloration. That color change is far more for social communication than it is for um, ultra camouflage. And sort of their standard coloration is, is the green. So there is a process going on in those specialized cells, those chromatophores and melanophores, um, under the skin there, there's layers of reflect, reflective crystals and special those, those special pores in the skin, if you like, the chameleon can expand and contract, and the, which lets different wavelengths of light um, appear on the skin to something looking at them. So unusual to see a, a grey one, but you can still see that characteristic white slash on the, uh, the bottom there. You'll always see that on the chameleon, that's a sort of a standard marking that they have. He could be mimicking the colour of the branch, but he's still in a green tree, so it's still unusual to see one not green this time of day, I would suggest. At night time, they go a paler colour, more of a cream, but this does seem to be a... I would say a decision has been made, but not the standard green coloration. Sitting in a buffalo thorn, I would not want to be climbing around in a buffalo thorn. You can see those vicious armaments there on the left. You can see that nice straight thorn and the hooked thorn which is characteristic of the buffalo thorn, the Zizifus mucronata. Ooh, Martin. Um, I don't know if there's one that can't change colour. As far as I know, kind of the defining characteristic of being a chameleon is that ability to change colour for whatever reason. Uh, I'm unaware of a chameleon that doesn't have the ability to alter the the color of its skin when it wants to for say for whatever reason so i don't think so but i honestly don't know there are such diversity i think we've got about oh, somewhere around about 15 chameleon species in southern africa and um, places like madagascar there are lots more and there are some weird and wonderful chameleons out there certainly uh, but as far as i know they can all change color something a little unusual to see. We actually saw one this morning as well, um, close to here, but not the same one. And I was going to go past the same tree to see if we could spot the one we saw this morning, because they often do remain in the tree during the daytime. Uh, we saw it crossing the road and then climbed up a little red bush willow next to the road. Again, potentially also looked like a male. We could actually even see the little bump where the tail joins the body, which is 
a little um, sort of protrusion that houses the hemipenes of the chameleon, but we can't see that from this angle. So I think that male was potentially just on the hunt for a female, so I'd be interested to see if he's still in the same tree. It's the smell then. It's really not nice. I'm just scared to room. I'm not putting it in my mouth. Okay, you have to touch it with your tongue. It's not actually that heavy. Ah! <laughs> join me. <laughs> say join. Okay, shall I come pull you out now? <laughs> I'm going home now. <laughs> I was staring off the side of the vehicle and hope to find some fresh tracks of something. But I believe there are some answers uh, as to where I was sitting to get that beautiful sunset. So I'll just wait for those to come through. Otherwise we're doing a first gear safari again. No we're not, I lie, I'm in low range, we're in third gear. Okay, Alina guessed Drakensberg Road. Nope, good guess though. I can see why you maybe said that. Uh, with Drakensberg Road, where I think you're thinking of, we would have been a little bit higher up and we might have been able to see a section of the Drakensberg. You, Lane, you win. You guessed quarantine clearing. That's exactly where I was, but I was just quite sneaky about it. I'd basically come from the dam cam. You remember, maybe you saw me drive past and then I was driving up towards the clearing. So we were looking at it that way and we were sitting quite low down on the road. It was just perfect how, you know, the trees obviously beautiful, beautifully silhouetted and then the sun just on top of the cloud. Good guess, well done. Very impressive. So I did bump into a guide this morning and I don't know if I even told you this, but this one guide said to me, you know, did I know where Marib's was? because there was a young male leopard that was sighted in uh, the Manuleti, in the southern parts of the Manuleti, and it was quite surprising that Marib's is there. But I don't really think so. I don't think it's surprising at all. Marib's is a, he's a young male leopard. He's very nomadic at the moment. He doesn't quite know what he's supposed to do with himself. We saw the same thing with Hosanna. He's 
in his territory where he grew up, where he feels comfortable, but he's going to start venturing off and going a little bit further and coming back until he doesn't come back again. I mean, even when Hosanna made, uh, he disappeared for ages and then came back, that was such a shock. It was a huge surprise to all of us that he came back to his sort of, um, his, his natal place. But anyways, so I don't know if that's what Marie is going to do again now, is that he's, it was marching sort of to the rest. I'm still, I'm just on Aubrey's road. I'm still just checking around here. Maybe he's jumped across the road he's moved out of the drainage line and you know we're actually just looking in the wrong places which could also be the case because we lost view of him i would i don't think even if we were in that sighting we would have been able to have kept up with him because the tambuetis are so dense along that drainage line and uh, even though we've got i mean rusty and it's a quite a small nimble car i i realistically don't think we would have been able to have followed him anyways but um, so from here, I'm kind of just going to head around, maybe go back past the dam again and just see if he comes up. Maybe I'll go to Gallego Pan. Maybe he's there having a drink. But um, I, you know, sitting on sitting on the open plains, I would have been able to have heard any alarm calls, anything along those lines. And I haven't. So maybe he's gone flat. Maybe he's having a siesta because he's been so busy during the day. Another possibility. We shall see. We will definitely see. Now we're just looking for anything. Anything. I'm going to be able to bring the spotlight out just now and then I'll be able to find some, hopefully some nighttime creatures. I haven't seen any genets since I've been here or we had one very brief view of a white-tailed mongoose. And maybe if I do head up around to Boyotella Dam again, I'll get a glimpse of that African wildcat that's been lingering around. I know that uh, it's been sighted on the dam cam quite recently. But speaking of cats, Lauren of course has spent the afternoon with slightly bigger cats than an African wildcat. We've been very busy, we've been walking, we've been scent marking, we've been roaring. But of course that all takes energy, so we've now settled down, but we're by no means going into the deep sleep that we were in earlier. That sun is going down, it's time to shine. The light is, this boy is stunning. I mentioned this the other day, but I really do love lions in the red sand. It's so strikingly different from seeing lions against the colour of their own skin, sandy sand. Oh, he's definitely alert. But no one's responding to your calls, boy. He's honestly magnificent. His physique, his hair, He's not that heavily scarred, really. By the end of a sort of male lion's tenure, you can see they're at the end of it. They still look great, but you can see far too many battle scars and, yeah. Welcome here. We are now checking here at uh, Leopard Dam. What we see here, tracks of uh, buffalo that is heading a little bit uh, to the uh, uh, southwest of the dam. Maybe we might be lucky. We'll try to uh, follow up here and see where the buffalo will take us to. And we're coming here to check. Uh, there were two wild dogs were at the exit, very close to the gate, moving. <laughs> Excuse me, to the west. Uh, this is the area where we might uh, come across with them, heading slightly to the east or to the north because the water source is right here. Most of the time, impala and all medium sized antelope, they might love to be in the area. Otherwise, he might have a zebra, uh, a zebra clearing maybe towards the camp. 
which we are aiming to towards that area. This is the right time for dogs to get active and move around in the area. Most of the hunt, it takes place, oh yes, here's the buffalo. The tracks of a buffalo that were tracking earlier on, it becomes positive, lovely. It, it's very common to find single buffalo here in this particular farm moving alone. We have seen three or four or five there by twin pens, but in the area I'm reading lots of tra uh, tracks of a single buffalo moving around leopard dam quite a lot. It's very strong, very healthy. A buffalo can fight back easily from the pride of lions, but especially the three female and one sub adult that we have spotted too early uh, this afternoon. A lonely buffalo like him, he can stand the ground and fight back from the lion. It's in the nature where the buffalo, most especially when they get into certain age, or if he feels like he's really tired to follow the breeding head of a female is heavier, you tend to select the area where it's viability of water and suitable grazing, of course, where you will graze around in that area and uh, went down to the water. He might be able to walk uh, in an area at least one square kilometer of an area that you will operate and make sure that uh, anything that comes there as female, if you have an opportunity of mating, you will join the, uh, the matriarchal mate. If not, he go his own way. But sometimes you find the Decker boys, which we call it the older males, will follow the females when they get into the area. Because the reason they're a lot more powerful when they get into the head itself, all the men that are always defending uh, the females and the youngsters and mating, they simply lose weight. When he gets in, he will be the one that have more stamina and a lot more powerful and he can able to mate with the female. We know that in nature, survival of the fittest. If you're not fit, you're not going to survive. And you're not fit, you're not going to mate. Females are more interested to a male that is more healthy, stronger. That means they will carry a very healthy gene pool of the uh, new generation of the area. And it's the reason behind that, because these animals, they live in the wild. In the wild, there's competition, and you get hunted by different sort of species. From as python, while you're still young, hyena, jackal, leopards, etc., etc., that might be there. If you're a youngster and it doesn't show that you are healthy, all these small animals, like as jackal, they might gang together and start to focus on the healthy youngster that will get born into the head itself. And that is a risk of life. And a hyena also, they the same. If anything is weak, they will hunt that. Let me move a little bit forward and able to um, reposition ourselves with this buffalo. Third, I get the question half. My radio is breaking. How the male determine the female is healthy? It, it, it's lots of things that, uh, from all these wild animals, when it comes to, practically when it comes to Saint Mark, they read quite a lot of scent information, and also on the dung information. It really tells the status of all individual species out in nature. From uh, Janet, Mangus, and all that, they can read from the scent itself. The status of a scent, it will tell. And once the female is healthy, it will enter into estrus, then they can mate. It's simple as that. It, they can read from the scent mark information, from the dung information that left behind. I mean, look at the body, yes, of course, that is from us, but you might find that animal, it can be so well fed and round. Meanwhile, it's not that much stronger. It's not healthy. It's not uh, uh, right to male or female to mate. It's weak, but that it will be read from the dung and also from the scent mark. That's the reason you find quite a lot. We learn from the leopard. All of you that join us this afternoon, you've seen Kalamba quite a lot scent marking or seen different leopard or all different lions. It could be Ngati blood, it can be Kuhumas. If they all go and scent mark, that information they leave behind, it tells the status of individual is how actually they can tell one another when it comes to fitness and when it comes to everything that they need to read. 
And the scent itself is a lot more important. If you are weak, you get challenged by your scent information that you post. It's like posting on a board that how do you feel, how strong you are. And others will come and say, I'm overweight from this kind of a scent. I'm the heavier champion. I can really challenge this one. Is how actually animal communi communicate in most cases. You tend to see even from runners they scrum the ground, leave the scent mark information, cross the road and all that. They are just to be followed by other species, uh, other rhinos in that particular area to read. And also they create a median. You look at the median, it's one of the perfect, perfect example. Defecate in the same point is how actually the other runner gets there, they read the scent information. If they really respect him that he's stronger, they cannot defecate at the same pool, they will defecate from Mossad. And actually actual doing so, defecating from far from the pool itself is submissive that he's stronger than everyone. In nature, is survival of the fittest when it comes to surviving and all that information leave behind. It's such amazing. Even lions gets into the point here, try to hunt this buffalo. They will first read the information. They will read the information and able to know whether to follow or not. Yes, we at uh, Okakuya Pan at the moment, but uh, as you can see, there's not much happening here. There's a couple of uh, hunted guinea fowl that's pretty much running on the other side of the pan. But yeah, we're just going to take a moment and just enjoy the sounds around at Okakuya. Well, we're taking a moment here on Juma, just having a little bit of quiet time and enjoying the first decent sunset we've had for a long time because it has been cloudy pretty much every night for about the last month or so. And it's also a good opportunity to sit and listen because I'm sure Tlumba is around somewhere and I believe Marips was seen earlier as well. So I'm on Vulture's Nest at the moment, close to the Bulawati. They're just obviously listening to see if we hear any alarm calls. But how about that for a vista? And a lovely scene. We've got a silhouetted knob thorn in the front. And somewhere soon in the background there, it's still a little bit bright. But we can actually see tonight, once it gets dark, 
all five of the visible planets will be visible so you can have a look on that western horizon give it a little bit more time uh, and you might be able to pick out we will be able to pick out both venus and mercury somewhere behind that brightness at the moment and then saturn is still above us and jupiter i can see very clearly almost directly overhead at the moment and mars will be coming up in the east after it gets to on another well it probably is up but it's still not quite visible yet but some lovely colours for sunset. Doesn't matter how many African sunsets you see, <coughs> excuse me, they never get dull. Uh, Charlie, I'm. I Got your question there. Uh, Tudu, could you just repeat it for me, please? Does it have an effect on where the animals rest? Um, when the animals rest, certainly, but I don't really think we would say so much about when the animals rest. I mean, if it's dark, it's dark. Uh, but generally speaking, say the prey species will either choose to sleep in the thick stuff or uh, will choose an open area where they've got good visibility of any potential predators sneaking up on them. Uh, but I don't really think it has a, an effect on where they would be. That's far more dictated by wind conditions and whether it's raining or not. But uh, the sun has been, or the earth has been going around the sun for however many, four and a half billion years or whatever it is. So I think the animals are pretty sort of comfortable with how it affects them now. Uh, certainly the length of daylight has an effect on their behaviour. Most animals have what's called a, a pineal eye, which is a gland in their eye. And in some species like lizards, you can actually physically see that third eye sort of on their forehead. There is a little aperture, a little opening there. A very simple eye that picks up the changes in the lengths of daylight and potentially think other factors like humidity. Um, and that is connected to uh, the pituitary gland, I think, or certainly something in the, the brain that regulates hormones. And it's the length of daylight uh, which will actually stimulate a lot of animals and birds for that matter and lizards and everything else to come into reproductive status or out of reproductive status based on the length of daylight hours. But I can't think that the sun would have an effect on where they would sleep. As I said, that's more dictated by other environmental factors. I suppose if it's very, very, very hot, then it might make them, obviously, even in excess of just taking shade, then they may find themselves moving down into drainage lines and things because, generally speaking, cooler air pools at lower areas than higher areas, and you've got more shade uh, from the big trees taking advantage of the underground water in drainage lines. But there's some lovely soft pinks and oranges, almost more the colours I'd expect from winter instead of summer. I'm just checking to see if I can see Venus anywhere. I think it was in the, uh, the Corsa tradition that there was a, a reward for the first person to see Venus during the daytime and they would be rewarded with a goat apparently the first person who saw as you know it was Canopus the, the second brightest star in the sky that was that uh, that's that little belief they'd look for the first person to see Canopus after dark for the season would be would receive a goat apparently uh, see now it is a wonderful sunset and I'm also just admiring it because so, we haven't seen very many lately and they are very special to be a part of it's a good time to just sit quietly and take it all in another day in the African bush. You can see a little bit of cloud cover on the horizon there. That will be from the Drakensberg Mountains. The, the air rising up the mountains and uh, as it does rise it condenses so that's why I've got a little bit of cloud there but other than that it is a crystal clear sky you can 
serenaded by various starlings and their characteristic white-browed scrub robins that we hear always late afternoon. Okay, what a spectacular and peaceful view. Uh, let's send you back over to Taylor and see if she's had any good luck on her night bumble. No luck just yet. Just bumbling still. Trying to stay on the road. I am going to go past Gallego Pan though. I just want to poke my nose in and have a little look around. So we're just on, on Gallego Road now and we'll turn onto Gallego Shortcut, go check the pan out and then do a little loop around Mvubu. But I haven't seen any tracks or heard any alarm calls. So I, I don't know where Marib's is anymore and I obviously was really looking forward to having a, an opportunity to see him uh, this evening. Just give, he gave everybody the slip. Um, so we'll listen out tonight around camp for sure. We don't, we don't pick him up now because obviously the, the rooms in which Ben and I are staying down at the bottom, they're right on this drainage line where Gallagher Pan is. So if Marib's does come past, I don't know how heavy of a sleeper Ben is, but maybe between the two of us, we'll have a, a good chance of figuring out where on earth he is. And he comes through camp sometimes too, so maybe he pops in to visit us. Although I'm not so fond of leopards around lodges and houses and things like that anymore. Um, I think we all get very complacent around them, which is not great. But hey, just with all the situations that have happened, like just in the last few months, I think we maybe need to, I think we've maybe taken things a step too far on the habituation level. But again, that's just my opinion. It's not anyone else's. Oh, a nightjar. Um, it's gone, it flew off the road. Never mind, we won't have a look at it. So yeah, I think, I think it's maybe we need to start just taking a little step back and let animals do their things and not encourage them to be right on our doorsteps. Hmm, Ryan, that's a great question actually. Uh, so Ryan has asked, what will determine where Marebs is going to establish his territory? So a big one for him, he needs to go and try and, oh, I missed my turn off. He needs to go and try and find like a safe space where there isn't too much pressure from other male leopards. That's, that's really going to be a great starting point because if he decides he's going to plonk himself between four very active uh, older male leopards, he's going to find himself in a bit of trouble. But as you have all seen and us as guides we've all seen is that quite often there are gaps Old, leopards get old, they, they also then become nomadic, they move off, they leave spaces open or they, get, they die, leopards get killed, you know, this type of thing. So there is always going to be a spot available somewhere that, you know, where, where another leopard is not necessarily going to move into because they're quite happy with their territory. So that's, that's a great opportunity for these young nomadic leopards that are looking to set up shop. So that's going to be um, a big determining factor. He's really at this age is not going to have much say as he if he wants the prime property If there's other bigger dominant leopards in there, they're not going to take too kindly to a young whippersnapper trying to creep in because there's Better opportunities to catch things. How many times do you think I've said opportunities? I've said that word a lot in the last one minute um, Anyways, so so that's going to be another one. So he's just going to have to make it you know make it work wherever he can find a space but it might take him a little while to settle down um, still so I think he's just testing waters like I said he feels very comfortable here and when I was here last year it was insane how many young male leopards were around I mean there was Tavangumi, there was Shasha, there was Tortoise, Tortoise Pan, Molwati, uh, oh man everyone was around here so it was quite busy and very impressive but obviously none of them have really stayed here permanently a lot of those especially the younger leopards have, have moved off just a little bit but still crossing paths every now and then so I think he's yeah he's just going to be happy wherever I'm not sure where he'll go uh, the nice thing is that he's very easy to identify you know with those big fluffy ears Shami's very sweet and wherever he goes 
Um, hopefully it's to another game reserve where you know people will just love him as much as everybody has loved him here at Juma. So I think you'll definitely be able to follow him. If he goes into the Kruger, which a lot of leopards do, that's obviously quite difficult as the Kruger is massive, doesn't have as extensive road network as what we've got on these reserves. And then obviously we have off-road privileges, we have all those things, you aren't able to do that when you're in the Kruger National Park. So it always becomes quite tricky. Look at Quar uh, Quarantine for an example. How uh, he quite often ventures into the Kruger and he doesn't get seen for months and months and months. And then he just pops up again. He's like, oh no, I'm still here, I'm still around. I've just been along the Timbavati River somewhere or whatever he's actually doing. Yeah. And then I heard someone say, I don't know how true it is though, that Shasha has moved down towards Mala Mala and I don't really know, like Tavangumi obviously pops in every now and then, especially down uh, towards the far sort of western corner and then I'm trying to think, I've never seen tortoise pan before, I, have I? Have I seen tortoise pan? You have to help me, I can't remember who I have and haven't seen over the years. I've forgotten, there was this one sighting I had of a very skittish male leopard in the distance with another very skittish female and I got that sighting live but I can't remember who it was. Please remind me, please help. Was that Molati or was that Tortoise Pan? I feel like it was one of the two. But anyways, we're just about to approach Galago Pan. Hoping that he's just going to be sitting here waiting for us. Wouldn't that be a nice way to end the show today? Last minute leopards are always appreciated. Last minute leopard. Goodness, and he just a couple of scrub hairs. Anyways, we'll do a loop around now one more time in the drainage line and hopefully he's going to pop up. Here at Wild Earth, we take great pride in curating our best animal content for you. Would you like our very best animal stories, highlights, questions and the inside scoop on all things Wild Earth before anyone else? Find it all as well as info on our exciting plans going forward first in the newsletter handmade just for you. Available to all Wild Earth explorers. Okay, the hunt for Marips 
Ort Lumber continues. Right area now, just coming up central towards Gary Cutline. I believe rips were seen somewhere over there this afternoon, but I was on Chitwa, which is a different channel, so I missed all of those updates. But I'm still convinced Lumber's here somewhere as well. But she does have that incredible ability to just disappear for days on end. And we're going to pretty much just check all these surrounding roads and hope that we get lucky or we get an indication from something else. Of course, there's always Impala up by quarantine, really good hunting grounds, but it's still strange to me. We don't see Leopard on quarantine very much, but it's a bit too open. Uh, leopards do prefer the thicker stuff. They don't like to be seen. And as I said earlier, that is why uh, the Impalas like to congregate on those open areas at night time, so a leopard can't sneak up on them. Have a look at Gary Jam. I did have say tracks this morning for a female leopard going up this road towards Gary Dam. But they're gonna also have tracks coming east across Gallego Pan and south of Buffalo Cutline. And it definitely wasn't a rips because he's got much bigger feet than Columba does, so big difference between a male and a female leopard. Uh, and we know he was seen around Cheetah Cutline this morning, so it's all a little bit mysterious. And how he got all the way from there. To Gallagher today because it was really quite hot this afternoon and he walked a long way. I think let's go round Gallagher Pan and just double check. The nice thing about having our dam cam, of course, is that if he does pop out here, we should hear. Oh, Thomas, uh, best road in the sands for leopard sightings. Uh, I mean, obviously that's a very subjective and personal question in terms of it'll be different for everybody else, but here on Juma, the road that I consider, or where I think, oh, I haven't seen a leopard for a while, I'm going to go there, is uh, Gallego, that shortcut Gallego. Uh, sorry, I just need to speak to Taylor. Uh, Taylor, just confirm you are on uh, on Mvubu because I'm coming up there from Galago Pan. I just want to make sure to turn around. Yeah, I'm right here. Close to that junction. Copy that. Uh, right, so I'm just going to turn around to Taylor's on this road, otherwise we're going to bump into each other. But uh, Galago is my road where I go for. I've had quite a few leopard sightings. Talumba used to always be seen on the road, and it's kind of a highway for Tavangumi when he comes in from the north. Uh, he also uses Galago quite a hook. So for some reason, just because I've had quite a few leopard sightings there, that's the one that always makes me excited. When I drive up or down there, I think for some reason I've filled I've got a far better chance of bumping into a leopard, but ach, it could happen any time, any place, really. If I have multiple sightings on this road, this will probably be my new leopard road as well. All right, well, there's a reason that I turned around, so I didn't want to bump into Taylor, so let's send you over to Taylor and find out why. We almost drove over the top of Marib's because he is, look at how he's sitting. He's sitting right next to the road. Like it's, it's right there, but he's obviously tucked away in the grass. Okay, I'm obviously being quite dramatic. I, I would never have driven over him because my tires would have been, of course, on the road. But, you know, for dramatic effect, because I am a safari guide and I like to tell a big story. But um, I'm glad we decided to do one last loop. Thank goodness we did that. So he zigzagged all the way through the drainage line and he's actually popped back out on, onto the road and look how exhausted he is. Are you sleeping? Yes, Taylor, I'm sleeping. Please keep quiet and go away. No, I've been chasing after you all afternoon, Marie, because we will sit here and we will watch you as you sleep, but I will talk a little bit softer. It's actually really funny how his ears 
look at night with the infrared light on and how fluffy they are. So I don't know what would have encouraged him to, to move around so much during the day. Yes, you catch that fly or grasshopper or whatever is bothering you. Um, unless, yeah, I don't know if the wild dogs started moving around again and maybe chased him or he honestly was just hungry. But it was quite warm today. Again, we've seen stranger things happen. It's not un, unusual for a, a young nomadic animal to be moving around during the day. They would prefer to not bump into any territorial individuals at night time when they're going to be more active. And now he is invisible. I am glad that he had his head up because otherwise I think I probably would have driven straight past him. And he doesn't move for anything. So we would have, uh, we would have not seen him at all. Look at that, completely invisible. Can't even notice that he's there. That camouflage is just so spectacular. Fast asleep, sleeping leopard for the end of drive. I think he's probably going to spend the rest of the night like this, or at least maybe the next hour or two, not doing too much. Oh, and you know what was flying into him? It's the alates. There are a couple of alates that are are flying about because they've flown into me. So I suspect that the same thing is happening to him. Welcome back. We get to the Zebra Drive. We're trying to look for anything that might come here, but mainly we're thinking maybe we might get to see the dogs, but unfortunately they might be still in the west. Anything that we can do is early in the morning. We might uh, start from uh, this area. We have learned quite a lot from today. Some of the area that we went to the east, there's hardly no tracks of uh, animals, but you tend to see some certain area where there's quite a lot of movement of dogs, lions, hyenas, and quite a lot of uh, lamb coal uh, from the uh, north from us, from Impala Plains. So it could be something there, leopards, or you never know, because our leopards here are not that, uh, all of them are not that much relaxed as from uh, Compatio Marids and other leopard down in sense. Who knows, one day as we are doing drive, we'll try to, as we can, able to follow them Slowly but sure, we'll get to have to eat it to your vehicles and they will be relaxed. Not so long. I hope, uh, yeah, we will try in the morning and our luck, maybe with wild dogs. If not, it could be something else. We have just spotted hyenas before we get to uh, Leopard Dam. Two, three hyenas were heading towards Impala Plains. Wherever it's hyenas, it's always a leopard. Hyena likes to follow leopards in most cases. There's no change. If we go to south, north, all the time know that uh, leopard will hunt, hyena that will be always be hunt. The reason behind that, hyena will be able to uh, really interact with the leopard and still they kill away and they can survive easily. That's the reason you find hyena highly populated. If you take uh, clans in Juma, you can see the hyena easy to generate. And uh, just because they can den like uh, other species, they don't change den quite often. This is what we will all be doing very soon, very, very, very soon. As Oh, no mosquito, no, no, absolutely not, no thanks, you can go bother someone else. Sorry, I had a mosquito flying around me and it's going to try and eat my blood. Don't do it, because if I get you, that'll be the end of you. I'm sure that Marie was saying that to the insect that was bothering him earlier, something along those lines. But we're going to be tucked away in bed very, very soon. 
as it has been not necessarily like a long day, but it's been slightly warmer and always on those hot days that, you know, the heat really takes it out, out of you. So I think Maribs and all of us are feeling a little bit that way, so early to bed. <laughs> Nina, thank you very much. I'm glad, uh, I'm really glad we managed to find him. And yeah, last minute leopard is wonderful. We'll even take it when they're completely camouflaged in the in the grass as as Marib's is. But he is just such a sweet boy. I, You know, it's really funny. We've watched so many young leopards, you know, grow until adulthood. And and I've also gone on lots of safaris with, with you, some of you who have been watching the shows for a long time. And it's one one thing when these leopards are, are young and they're so comical and entertaining, they're clumsy and stuff like that, but it's amazing how when they become adults, how they change and they just lose that quirkiness completely. And it's it's funny how it's almost just a switch. It just happens overnight. It does, you know, it's, I, I always feel like it's not a gradual thing. Just one minute they're young and goofy and then the next minute they're adults and they're territorial males, scent marking, looking for females to mate with, like, you, you know, you name it. And it's always just uh, miraculous to be able and so fortunate to be able to see that full circle and how we've seen it for so many years here at Wild Earth. So I don't think that's anything that I'll ever take for granted is being able to follow individual animals and learn about their personalities and and just learning so much more about animal behavior and also seeing how animal behavior can be so specific to individuals um, of various species too. But it has been a wonderful afternoon with lots of big cats to keep you all entertained. And I'm sure Maribs will be back on form tomorrow. I'm hoping he doesn't cross north and he actually just lingers around and maybe maybe Ben will have a, a chance to see him. Or maybe we'll get another chance to see him a bit on the active side. But but it has been a fun day. And I know that everybody at from Lauren to Rexon and, of course, Ben and I, um, and the rest of the crew driving around or chatting to you live from the cameras have really enjoyed ourselves and we hope that you have enjoyed yourself too. And remember, you can download the Wild Earth app in case you have missed uh, most of the show and watch the best bits. So please do that. Otherwise, you're just going to have to join us live for another sunrise safari tomorrow morning. A big thank you and we'll see you soon.